Mark made his way slowly down one of the narrow, dusty streets. He still limped slightly, and a cheap cardboard suitcase carried the few possessions he had brought to replace those he had lost on the escarpment. The clothes he wore were an improvement on the shapeless demobilisation suit that the army had given him. His flannels were neatly creased, and the blue blazer fitted his good shoulders and narrow flanks. The open-necked white shirt was snowy clean, and set off the smooth brown skin of his neck and face. He reached the cottage, numbered 55 on the gate, and it was a mirror image of those on each side and opposite. He opened the gate and went up the short flagged path, aware that somebody was watching him from behind the lace curtain in the front room. However, when he knocked on the front door, it was only opened after a delay of many minutes, and Mark blinked at the woman who stood there. Her dark, short hair was freshly combed, and the clothes she wore had clearly been hastily put on in place of dowdier everyday dress. She was still fastening the belt at her slim waist. It was a dress of pale blue with a design of yellow daisies, and it made her appear young and gay, although Mark saw at once that she was at least ten years older than he was. Yes, she asked, tempering the abrupt demand with a smile. Does Fergus MacDonald live here? He saw now that she was good-looking, not pretty, but fine-looking with good bones in her cheeks and dark, intelligent eyes. Yes, this is Mr. MacDonald's house. There was a foreign inflection in her voice that was intriguing. I am Mrs. MacDonald. Oh, he said, taken by surprise. He had known Fergus was married. He, he had spoken about it often, but Mark had never really thought about his wife before, not as a real flesh-and-blood woman, and certainly not one like this. I am I'm an old friend of Fergus's from the army. Oh, I see, she hesitated. And my name's Mark, Mark Anders. Instantly her attitude changed. The half-smile bloomed and lit her whole face. She gave a small gasp of pleasure. Mark! Of course, Mark! She took his arm impetuously and drew him over the threshold. He has spoken of you so often. I feel I know you so well, like a member of the family, like a brother. She still had his arm standing close to him, laughing up at him. Come in, Mark, come in. I am Helena. Fergus MacDonald sat at the head of the deal table in the dingy kitchen. The table was covered with sheets of newsprint instead of a cloth, and Fergus hunched over his plate and scowled angrily as he listened to Mark's account of his flight from Ladyburg. The bastards! They are the enemy, Mark! The new enemy. His mouth was filled with potato and heavily spiced borovos, thick farmer's sausage, and he spoke through it. We're in another war, lad, and this time they're worse than the bloody Hun. More beer, Mark. Helena leaned across to fill his tumbler from the black quart bottle. Thank you. Mark watched the foaming head rise in his glass, and he pondered Fergus's statement. I don't understand, Fergus. I don't know who these men are. I don't know why they tried to kill me. They are the bosses, lad. That's who we're fighting now, the rich, the mine owners, the bankers, all those who oppress the working man. Mark took a long swallow of his beer, and Helena smiled at him from across the table. Fergus is right, Mark. We have to destroy them. And she began to talk. It was strange, confusing talk from a woman, and there was a fanatical light in her dark eyes. The words had a compelling power in her clear, articulate voice, with its lilting accent, and Mark watched the way she used her hands to emphasise each point. They were neat, strong hands with gracefully tapered fingers and short nails. The nails were clean and trimmed, but the first two fingers of her right hand were stained pale yellow. Mark wondered at that, until suddenly Helena reached across and took a cigarette from the pack at Fergus's elbow. Still talking, she lit the cigarette from a match in her cupped hands and drew deeply before exhaling forcibly through pursed lips. Mark had never seen a woman smoke before, and he stared at her. She shook her head vehemently. The history of the people's revolt is written in blood. Look at France. See how the revolution sweeps forward in Russia. The short, dark, shining curls danced around her smooth, pale cheeks, and she pursed her lips again to drag at the cigarette, and in some strange fashion Mark found the mannish act shocking and exciting. He felt his groin clenching, the tight, swollen hardening of his flesh, beyond his reason, far beyond his control. His breathing caught with shock and embarrassment, 
and he leaned back and slipped one hand into his trouser pocket, certain that both of them must be aware of his shameful reaction. But instead, Helena reached across the table and seized his other wrist in a surprisingly powerful grip. We know our enemy. We know what must be done and how we must do it, Mark. Her fingers seemed to burn like heated iron into his flesh. He felt dizzy with the force of it. His voice was hoarse as he forced himself to reply. They are strong, Helena. Powerful. No, no, Mark. The workers are strong. The enemy are weak and smug. They suspect nothing. They wallow like hogs in the false security of their golden sovereigns. But in reality they are few and unprepared. They do not know their own weakness. And as yet the workers do not realise their great strength. We will teach them. You're right, lass. Fergus wiped the gravy from the plate with a crust of bread and stuffed it into his mouth. Listen to her, Mark. We are building a new world, a brave and beautiful new world. He belched loudly and pushed his plate away, leaving both elbows on the table. But first we have to tear down and destroy this rotten, unjust and corrupt society. There'll be hard fighting and we will need good, hard fighting men. He laughed harshly and slapped Mark's shoulder. They'll call for MacDonald and Anders again, lad. You hear me. There is nothing for us to lose, Mark. Helena's cheeks were flushed. Nothing but our chains. And there is a whole world to win. Karl Marx said that, and it's one of the great truths of history. Helena, are you... He hesitated to use the word. Are you and Fergus... Well, I mean, you aren't Bolsheviks, are you? That's what the bosses and their minions, the police, call us. She laughed contemptuously. They try to make us criminals. Already they fear us. With reason, Mark, we will give them reason. No, lad, don't call us Bolsheviks. We are members of the Communist Party, dedicated to universal communism. I am the local party secretary and shop steward of the Mine Workers' Union for the Boilermakers' Shop. Have you read Karl Marx? Helena demanded. No. Mark shook his head, dazed and shocked, but still sexually excited by her to the edge of pain. Fergus a Bolshevik? A bomb-throwing monster? But he knew he was not. He was an old and trusted comrade. I will lend you my copy. Come on, lass, Fergus chuckled and shook his head. We're going too fast for the lad. He's got a right balmy look right now. He leaned over and placed an affectionate arm around Mark's shoulders, drawing him close. Have you a place to stay, lad? A job? A place to go? No, Mark flushed. I haven't, Fergus. Oh, yes, you have. Helena cut in quickly. I have fixed the bed in the other room. You will stay here, Mark. Oh, but I couldn't. It is done, she said simply. You'll stay, lad, Fergus squeezed him hard, and we'll see about a job for you tomorrow. Your book learned? You can read and write and figure? It'll be easy to fix you. I know they need a clerk up at the pay office, and the paymaster is a comrade, a member of the party. I'll pay for lodging. Course you will. Fergus chuckled again and filled his glass to the brim with beer. It's good to see you again, son. And he raised his own glass. Send down the line for MacDonald and Anders and warn the bastards we're coming. He took a long swallow, the pointed Adam's apple bobbing in his throat, then wiped the froth from his upper lip with the back of his hand. The regimental chaplain had called it the sin of Onan, while the rankers had many more rival terms for it, toss the caber, or visit Mrs. Hand and her five daughters. The chaplain had warned of the dire consequences that it would bring. Failing sight and falling hair, a palsied shaking hand, and at last idiocy and the insane asylum. Mark lay in the narrow iron bed and stared with unseeing eyes at the faded pink rose-pattern wallpaper of the tiny room. It had the musty smell of being long closed, and there was a wash basin in an iron frame with an enamel basin against the far wall. A single unshaded bulb hung on a length of flex from the ceiling, and the white plaster around it was fly-speckled. Even at the moment, three drowsy flies sat on the flex in a stupor. Mark swivelled his attention to them, trying to put aside the waves of temptation that flowed up through his body. Light steps in the passage stopped opposite his bedroom door, and now there was a tap on the woodwork. Mark? He sat up quickly, letting the single thin blanket fall to his waist. May I come in? Yes, he husked, 
and the door swung open. Helena crossed to his bed. She wore a gown of light pink shiny material that buttoned down the front. The skirt opened at each step, and there was a glimpse of smooth white flesh above her knees. She carried a slim book in one hand. I said I would lend it to you, she explained. Read it, Mark. She held out the volume. The Communist Manifesto was the title, and Mark took it from her, opening it at random. He bowed his head over the open pages to cover the confusion into which her near presence plunged him. Thank you, Helena. He used her name for the first time, wanting her to leave and yet hoping she would stay. She leaned over him a little, looking at the open book, and the bodice of her gown fell apart an inch. Mark looked up and saw the incredibly silky sheen where the beginning of one white breast pressed against the lace that edged the neck of the gown. Swiftly he dropped his eyes again, and they were both silent until Mark could stand it no longer. And he looked up at her. Helena, he began, and then stopped. There was a smile, a secret womanly smile on her lips, lips that were slightly parted and moist in the harsh electric light. The dark eyes were half-hooded, but glowed again with that fierce, fanatical light, and her bosom beneath the pink satin rose and fell with quick, soundless breathing. He flushed a sultry red under the dark tan of his cheeks, and he rolled abruptly onto his side, drawing up his knees. Helena straightened up slowly, still smiling. Good night, Mark. She touched his shoulder. Fire sprang afresh from her fingertips, and then she turned and went slowly towards the door. The slippery material of the gown slid softly across the tight double rounds of her buttocks. I leave the light on, she looked back at him, and now the smile was knowing. You'll want to read. The pay office of Crown Deep Mines Limited was a long, austere room where five other clerks worked at high desks set in a line down one wall. They were mostly men in advanced middle age, two of them sufferers from thysis, that dreaded disease of the miners in which the rock dust from the drills settled in the lungs, building up slowly until the lung turned to stone and gradually crippled the man. Employment in the mine offices was a form of pension. The other three were grey and drab men, stooped from poring over their ledgers. The atmosphere in the office was quiet and joyless, as in some monastic cloister. Mark was given charge of the files and personnel R to Z, and the work was dull and repetitive, soon becoming automatic, as he calculated overtime and leave pay, made deductions for rent and union fees, and struck his totals. It was drudgery, not nearly enough to engage a bright and active young brain, and the narrow confines of the office were a cage for a spirit that was at home in the wide open sweep of sky and felt, and had known the cataclysmic universe of the battlefields of France. On the weekends, he escaped from his cage and rode on an old bicycle for miles into the open felt, following dusty paths along the base of the rocky copies, on which grew the regal candelabra of giant aloes, their blooms burning in bright scarlet against the clear, pale blue of the high felt sky. He sought seclusion, wilderness, secret places far from other men, but it seemed that always there were the barriers of barbed wire to limit his range. The grasslands had gone to the plough, the pale dust devils swirled and danced over red earth from which the harvest had been stripped, leaving the dried, sparse stubble of maize stalks. The great herds of game that once had covered the open grassland to the full range of the eye were long gone, and now small scrub cattle, multicoloured and scrawny, grazed in mindless bovine herds, tended by almost naked black pickaninnies, who paused to watch Mark peddling by and greeted him with solemnity, which turned to wide-eyed pleasure when he returned the greeting in their own language. Once in a while Mark would start a small grey diker from its lay and send it bounding and bouncing away through the dry grass with small sharp horns and ears erect, or else catch a glimpse of a springbuck drifting elusive as smoke across the plain lonely survivors of the long rifles. Then the delight of their wild presence stayed long with him, warming him on the dark, cold ride home. He needed these times of quiet and solitude, 
to complete the healing process, not only of the Maxim bullet wounds in his back, but of the deeper wounds, soul damage caused by too early an exposure to war in all its horror. He needed this quietness also to evaluate the swift rush of events that filled his evenings and nights in direct contrast to the grey drudgery of his working days. His working days. His working days. His working days. Mark was carried along by the fanatical energy of Fergus MacDonald and Helena. Fergus was the comrade who had shared with him experience that most men never knew, the stark and terrible involvement of combat. He was also much older than Mark, a paternal figure, filling a deep need in his life. It was easy to suspend the critical faculties and believe, not to think, but to follow blindly wherever Fergus's bitter, restless energy led them. There was excitement and a sense of commitment in those meetings with men like him, men with an ideal and a sense of destiny, the secret meetings in locked rooms with armed guards at the doors, the atmosphere quivering with the promise of forbidden things, the cigarette smoke spiralling upwards until it filled the room with a thick blue haze, like incense burning at some mystic rite, the faces shining with sweat and quiet frenzy of the fanatic as they listened to the speakers. Harry Fisher, the chairman of the party, was a tall, fierce man with a heavy gut, the brawny shoulders and hairy, muscular arms of a boilermaker, an unkempt shock of coarse, wiry black hair laced with strands of silver and dark, burning eyes. We are the party, the Praetorian Guard of the Proletariat, and we are not bound by law or the ethical considerations of the bourgeois age. The party in itself is the new law, the natural law of existence. Afterwards he shook hands with Mark, while Fergus stood by with paternal pride. Fisher's grip was as fierce as his stare. You're a soldier, he nodded. We will need you again, comrade. There is bloody work ahead. The disquieting presence of the man stayed to haunt Mark long afterwards, even when they rode home in the crowded tram car. The three of them squeezed into a double seat so that Helena's thigh was pressed hard against his. When she spoke to him, she leaned sideways, her lips almost touching his cheek, and her breath smelling of licorice and cigarettes, a smell that mingled with the cheap flowery perfume she wore and the underlying musky warmth of her woman's body. There were other meetings on the Friday evenings, great raucous shouting gatherings where hundreds of white miners crowded into the huge Fordsburg Trades Union Hall, most of them boozy with cheap brandy, loud and inarticulate and spoiling for trouble. They roared like the crowd at a bullfight as the speakers harangued them. Occasionally one of the audience climbed onto his chair to sway there, shouting meaningless confused slogans until his laughing comrades dragged him down. One of the most popular speakers at these public meetings was Fergus MacDonald. He had a dozen tricks to excite his audience. He probed their secret fears and twisted the probe until they howled half in pain and half in adulation. You know what they're planning, the bosses? You know what they're going to do? First they will fragment the trades, a thunderous ugly roar that shook the windows in their frames. And Fergus paused on the stage, sweeping his sparse sandy hair back off his forehead and grinning down at them with his thin bitter mouth until the sound subsided. The trade that took you five years to learn, they'll split it up and now there'll be three unskilled men to do your job with only a year's training to learn that fragment and they'll pay them a tenth of the wage you draw. A storming roar of, No! No! And Fergus flung it back at them. Yes! He shouted. Yes! Yes! And yes again! That is what the bosses are going to do. And that's not all. They're going to use blacks in your jobs. Black men are going to take those jobs away from you. Black men who will work for a wage that you cannot live on. They screamed now, frantic with anger. A terrible anger which had no object on which to focus. What about your kids? Are you going to feed them on mealies? Are your wives going to wear limbo? That's what'll happen when the blacks take your jobs. No, they roared, no. Workers of the world, Fergus shouted at them. Workers of the world, unite and keep our country white. The bellow of applause, the rhythmic stamp of feet on the wooden floor lasted for ten minutes, while Fergus strutted back and forth across the stage, clasping his hands above his head like a prize fighter. When at last the cheering faltered, he flung back his head and bellowed the opening line of the red flag. 
The entire hall came crashing to its feet and stood at attention to sing the revolutionary song. Then raise the scarlet standard high. Within its shade we'll live or die. Though cowards flinch and traitors sneer, we'll keep the red flag flying here. Mark walked home with the McDonald's in the frosty night, their breathing smoking like ostrich plumes in the lights of the street lamps. Helena walked between the men, a small, dainty figure in her black overcoat with rabbit fur collar and a knitted cap pulled down over her head. She had slipped a hand into the crook of the elbows of each of them, a seemingly natural, impartial gesture, but there was a disturbing pressure of fingers on the hard muscle of Mark's upper arm, and her hip touched his as she skipped occasionally to catch the longer stride of the men. Listen, Fergus, what you were saying there in the hall doesn't make sense, you know, Mark broke the silence as they turned into the home street. You can't have it both ways, workers unite and keep it white. Fergus chuckled appreciatively. You're a bright one, lad, comrade Mark. But I'm serious, Fergus. It's not the way, Harry Fisher. Course not, lad. Tonight I was shoveling up swill for the hogs. We need them fighting mad. We have things to tear down, bloody work to do. He stopped and turned to face Mark over the woman's head. We need cannon fodder, lad, and plenty of it. So it won't be like that, Mark asked. No, lad, it'll be a beautiful, brave new world. All men equal, all men happy, no bosses, a worker's state. Mark tried to control his pricking, nagging doubts. You keep talking of fighting, Fergus. Do you mean that? Literally, I mean. Will it be a shooting war? A shooting war, comrade, a bloody shooting war, just like the revolution in Russia, where comrade Lenin has shown us the way. We have to burn away the dross. We have to soak this earth with the blood of the rulers and the bosses. We have to flood it with the blood of their minions, the petty bourgeois officers' class of the police and military. What will... Mark almost said we, but it would not come to his lips. He could not make that commitment. Uh, what will you um, fight with? Fergus chuckled again and winked slyly. Oh, Mum's the word, lad, but it's time you knew a little more. He nodded. Yes, tomorrow night, he decided. On Saturday there was a bazaar being held in the trades hall, a women's union fundraising drive for building the new church. Where the crazed mob had screamed murder and bloody revolution the previous night, now there were long trestle tables set out and the women hovered over their displays of baked and fancily iced cakes, trays of tarts, preserved fruit in jars and jams. Mark bought a packet of tarts for a penny, and he and Fergus munched them as they wandered idly down the hall, stopping at the piles of second-hand clothing, while Fergus tried a maroon cardigan, and after careful deliberation purchased it for half a crown. They reached the top of the hall and stood beneath the raised stage. Fergus surveyed the room casually and then took Mark's arm and led him up the steps. They crossed the stage quietly and went in through a door in the wings into a maze of small union offices and storerooms, all deserted now on a Saturday afternoon. Fergus used a key from his watch chain to unlock a low iron door and they stooped through it. Fergus relocked behind him and they went down a narrow flight of steps that descended steeply. There was a smell of damp and earth and Mark realised that they were descending to the cellars. Fergus tapped on the door at the bottom of the stairs, and after a moment a single eye regarded them balefully through a peephole. All right, comrade, Fergus MacDonald, a committee member. There was the rattle of chains, and the door opened. A disgruntled, roughly dressed man stood aside for them. He was unshaven and sullen, and against the wall of the tiny room was a table and chair, still spread with the remains of a meal and the crumpled daily newspaper. The man grunted, and Fergus led Mark across the room and through another door into the cellars. The floor was earthen, and the arched columns were in raw, unplastered brick. There was the stench of dust and rats, stale, dank air in confined space. A single bulb lit the centre starkly, but left the alcoves behind the arches in shadow. Here, yeah, lad. This is what we're going to use. There were wooden cases stacked neatly to the height of a man's head in the alcoves, and the stacks were draped with heavy tarpaulin, obviously stolen from the railway yards, for they were stenciled S-A-R and H, 
South African railways and harbours. Fergus lifted the edge of one tarpaulin and grinned that thin, humorless smile. Still in the grease, lad. The wooden cases were branded with the distinctive arrowhead and WD of the British War Department, and below that the inscription, Six Pieces, Lee Enfield, Mark IV, CNVD. Mark was stunned. Good God, Fergus, there are hundreds of them. That's it, lad, and this is only one arsenal. There are others all along the Rand. He lifted another tarpaulin, walking on down the length of the cellar. The ammunition cases with the quick-release catches on the detachable lids that were painted, 1,000 rounds, point three oh three. We have enough to do the job, Fergus squeezed Mark's arm and led him on. There were racks of rifles now, ready for instant use, blued steel glistening with gun oil in the electric light. Fergus picked out a single rifle and handed it to Mark. This one's got your name on it. Mark took the weapon, and the feel of it in his hands was terribly familiar. It's the only one we've got, but the moment I saw it, I thought of you. When the time comes, you'll be using it. The P-14 sniper's rifle had that special balance that felt just right in his hands, but made Mark sick in the stomach. He handed it back to Fergus without a word, but the older man winked at him before racking it again carefully. Like a showman, Fergus had kept the best for last. With a flourish, he whipped the canvas off the heavy weapon with its thick, corrugated, water-jacketed barrel that squatted on its steel tripod. The Maxim machine gun, in its various forms, had the dubious distinction of having killed more human beings than any other single weapon that man's destructive genius had been able to devise. This was one of that deadly family, the Vickers Maxim point three oh three Mark IV B, and there were boxes stacked beside it, each containing a belt of 250 rounds. The gun could throw those at 2,440 feet per second and at a cyclic rate of 750 rounds a minute. How about that, comrade? You asked what we were going to fight with. How will that do for a beginning? In the silence, Mark could hear faintly but distinctly the sound of children's laughter from the hall above them. Mark sat alone upon the highest crest of the low copies that stretched into the west, black ironstone ridges breaking out of the flat, dry earth like the crested back of a crocodile surfacing from still lake water. The memory of the hidden arsenal had stayed with him through the night, keeping him from sleep, so that now his eyes felt gritty and his skin stretched tight and dry across the bones of his cheeks. Lack of sleep had left him with that remote feeling, a lightness of thought detached from reality, so now he sat in the bright sunlight, blinking like a day-flying owl and looking like a stranger into his own mind. He felt a rising sense of dismay, as he realised how idly he had drifted along the path that had brought him here to this very brink of the abyss. It had taken the feel of the P-14 in his hands and the laughter of children to bring him up at the end of a rope. All his training, all his deepest beliefs were centred on the sanctity of law, on the order and responsibilities of society. He had fought for that, had spent all of his adult life fighting for that belief, now suddenly he had drifted out of apathy to the camp of the enemy. Already he was numbered with the legions of the lawless. Already they were arming him to begin the work of destruction. There was no question now that it was merely empty rhetoric shouted at gatherings of drunken labourers. He had seen the guns. It would be cruel and without mercy. He knew Harry Fisher, had recognised the forces that drove him. He knew Fergus MacDonald. The man had killed before and often. He would not flick an eyelid when he killed again. Mark groaned aloud, aghast at what he had let happen to himself. He who knew what war really was, he who had worn the king's uniform and won his medal for courage. He felt the oily warmth of shame in his throat, a gagging sensation, and to arm himself against future weakness of this same kind, he tried to find the reasons why he had been drawn in, he realised now that he had been lost and alone, without family or home, and Fergus MacDonald had been the only shelter in the cold. Fergus, the older comrade of shared dangers, whom he had trusted without question. Fergus, the father figure. 
and he had followed again, grateful for the guidance, not questioning the destination. 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 There had, of course, been Helena as well, and the hold she had over him, the tightest grip any human could have over another. He had been, and still was, totally obsessed with her. She had awakened his long-suppressed and tightly controlled sexuality. Now it was but a breath away from bursting the wall he had built to damn it. When it burst, it might be a force he could not control, and that thought terrified him almost as much as the other. He tried now to separate the woman from her womanhood, tried to see the person beyond this devastating web she wove around his senses, and he succeeded in as much as he realised that she was not a person he could admire, not the mother he would choose for his children. Also she was the wife of an old comrade who trusted him completely. Now he felt he was ready to make the decision to leave, and to carry that resolve through firmly. He would leave Fordsburg immediately, leave Fergus MacDonald and his dark cataclysmic schemes. He felt his spirits lighten instantly at the prospect. He would not miss him, nor that drab monastic pay office with its daily penance of boredom and drudgery. He felt the bright young spirit of anticipation flame again. He would leave Fordsburg on the next train, and Helena. Immediately the flame flickered, and his spirit plunged. There was a physical pain in his groin at the prospect, and he felt the cracks open in the damn wall of his passions. It was dark when he left his bicycle in the garden shed, and he heard voices raised jovially in the house, and bursts of laughter. Lights blazed beyond the curtained kitchen windows, and when he stepped into the room there were four men at the table. Helena crossed quickly and hugged him impulsively, laughing, with high spots of colour in her cheeks, before taking his hand and leading him to the table. Welcome, comrade. Harry Fisher looked up at Mark with those disturbing eyes and the shock of dark, wiry hair hanging onto his forehead. You're in time to join the celebration. Grab the ladder glass, Helena, laughed Fergus, and she dropped his hand and hurried to the cupboard to fetch a glass and fill it with black stout from the bottle. Harry Fisher raised his own glass to Fergus. Comrades, I give you the new member of the Central Committee, Fergus MacDonald. Isn't it wonderful, Mark? Helena squeezed Mark's hand. He's a good man, growled Harry Fisher. The appointment isn't too soon. We need men with Comrade MacDonald's guts. The others nodded agreement over their stout glasses. The two of them were both members of the local committee of the party. Mark knew them well from the meetings. Come, lad. Fergus made room for him at the table, and he squeezed in beside him, drawing all their attention. And you, young Mark? Harry Fisher laid a powerful, hairy hand on his shoulder. We're going to issue you your party card. How about that, lad? Fergus winked and nudged Mark in the ribs. Usually it takes two years or more. We don't let the rabble into the party. But you've got friends on the Central Committee now. A Mark was about to speak, to refuse the honour he was being accorded. Nobody had asked him. They had taken it that he was Fergus's protégé. He was for them. Mark was about to deny it, to tell them the decision he had made that day, when that sense of danger warned him. He had seen the guns. If he was not a friend, then he was an enemy with a fatal secret, a secret that they could not risk. He had no doubts at all about these men now. If he was an enemy, then they would see that he never passed that secret on to another man. But the moment for refusal had passed. Comrade MacDonald, I've got a mission for you. It's urgent and vital. Can you leave your work for two weeks? I've got a sick mother, Fergus chuckled. When do you want me to go, and what do you want me to do? I want you to leave, say, Wednesday. That'll give me time to give you your orders, and for you to make your arrangements. Harry Fisher took a swallow of stout, and the froth stayed on his upper lip. I'm sending you to visit all the local committees, Cape Town, Bloemfontein, Port Elizabeth, so that each of them can be coordinated. Mark felt a guilty lift of relief at the words. There would be no confrontation with Fergus now. He could merely slip away while he was gone on his mission. Then he glanced up and was startled by the gaze that Helena had fastened upon him. She stared at him with the fixed, hungry expression of a leopard watching its prey from cover in the last instant before its spring. Now when their eyes met, she smiled again, that secret knowing smile, 
and the tip of her pink tongue dabbed at her slightly parted lips. Mark's heart pounded to the point of physical pain, and he dropped his eyes hurriedly to his glass. He was to be alone with Helena, and the prospect filled him with dread and a surging, passionate heat. Mark carried Ferguson's cheap and badly battered suitcase down to the station, and as they took the short cut across the open felt, the thick frost crunched like sugar under their feet and sparkled in myriad diamond points of light in the first rays of the sun. At the station they waited with four other members of the party for the southbound mail, and when at last it came, puffing hoarsely, shooting steam high into the frosty air, it was thirty-five minutes late. Thirty-five minutes late is almost early for the railways, Fergus laughed, and shook hands with each of them in turn, slapping their shoulders before scrambling up the steel ladder into the coach. Mark passed his suitcase up through the open window. Look after Helena, lad, and yourself. Mark stood and watched the train run out southwards, shrinking dramatically in size until the sound of it was a mere whisper, fading to nothingness. Then he turned and started up the hill towards the mine, just as the hooters began their mournful wailing howl that echoed off the yellow mesas of the dumps, summoning the disorderly columns of men to their appointed labours. Mark walked with them, one in a thousand, distinguished from the others neither in appearance nor achievement. Once again he felt a sense of seething discontent, a vague but growing knowledge that this was not all that was life, not all that he was capable of doing with his youth and energy, and he looked curiously at the men who hurried with him towards the iron gates, at the mine hooters' imperious summons. All of them wore that closed, withdrawn look, behind which Mark was convinced lurked the same misgivings as now assaulted him. Surely they also felt the futility of the dull daily repetition. The young ones at least must feel it. The older and greyer must regret it. Deep down they must mourn for the long sunny days now past, spent toiling in endless drudgery for another man's coin. They must mourn the fact that when they went they would leave no footprints, no ripple on the surface, no monument, except perhaps a few suns to repeat the meaningless cycle all of them interchangeable, all of them dispensable. He paused at the gates, standing aside while the stream of humanity flowed past him, and slowly the sense of excitement built up in him, the certainty that there was something, some special and worthwhile task for him to perform, some special place that waited for him, and he knew he must go on and find it. He hurried forward, suddenly grateful to Fergus MacDonald for placing this pressure on him, for forcing him to face himself, for breaking the easy, drifting course he had taken since his flight from Ladyburg. "'You're late, Anders,' the supervisor looked up from his ledgers severely, and each of his juniors repeated the gesture, a long row of them with the same narrow, disapproving expressions. "'What have you got to say?' "'I merely called to clean out my desk,' said Mark, smiling, the excitement still on him, "'and to throw in my time.' The disapproving expressions changed slowly to shock. It was dusk when Mark opened the back gate of the cottage and went up the short walk to the kitchen. He had walked all day at random, driven on restlessly by a new torrent of energy and exciting thoughts. He had not realised how hungry he was until he saw the lights in the window and smelled the faint aroma of cooking. The kitchen was deserted, but Helena called through from the front. "'Mark, is that you?' Before he could answer, she appeared in the kitchen door and leaned one hip against the jam. "'I thought you weren't coming home tonight.' She wore the blue dress, and Mark knew now that it was her best, reserved for special occasions, and she wore cosmetics, something that Mark had never seen her do before. There were spots of rouge on her cheeks, and her lips were painted, giving new luster to her usually sallow skin. The short, dark hair was newly washed, shiny in the lamplight and brushed back, caught over one ear with a tortoise-shell clasp. Mark stared at her. Her legs were smooth and sleek in silken stockings, the feet neatly clad in small pumps. Why are you staring, Mark? You are... Mark's voice turned husky and caught. He cleared his throat. Um, you're very pretty tonight. Thank you, sir. She laughed a low, throaty chuckle, and she did a slow pirouette, 
flaring the blue filmy skirt above the silken legs. I'm glad you like it. Then she stopped beside him and took his arm. Her touch was a delicious shock, like diving into a mountain pool. Sit down, Mark. She led him to the chair at the head of the table. Let me get you a nice beer. She went to the ice box, and while she pulled the cap on the bottle and poured, she ran on gaily. I found a goose at the butcher's. Do you like roast goose? Saliva poured from under Mark's tongue. I love it, with roast potato and pumpkin pie. For that I would sell my soul. Helena laughed delightedly. It wasn't one of Mark's usual shy and reserved replies. There was a sense of excitement surrounding him, like an aura this evening, echoing her own excitement. She brought the two glasses and propped one hip on the table. What shall we drink to? To freedom, he said without hesitation, and a good tomorrow. I like that, she said, and clinked his glass, leaning over him so that the bodice of her dress was at the level of his eyes. But why only tomorrow? Why can't the good time start right now, this minute? Mark laughed. All right, here's to a good tonight and a good tomorrow. Mark, Helena pursed her lips in mock disapproval, and immediately he blushed and laughed in confusion. Oh, no, I, I, I didn't mean... <laughs> that sounded dreadful, I didn't... I bet you say that to all the girls, Helena stood up quickly. She did not want to embarrass him and break the mood, so she crossed to the stove. It's ready, she announced, if you want to eat now. She sat opposite him, anticipating his appetite, buttering the thick slices of bread with yellow farm butter and keeping his glass fully charged. Aren't you eating? I'm not hungry. It's good. You don't know what you're missing. Better than your other girls cooked for you? she demanded playfully, and Mark dropped his eyes to his plate and busily loaded his fork. There weren't any other girls. Oh, Mark, you don't expect me to believe that? A handsome young fellow like you and those French girls, I bet you drove them mad. We were too busy. And besides... he stopped. Besides what? she insisted, and he looked up at her, silent for a moment, and then he began to talk. It was suddenly so easy to talk to her, and he was buoyed up with his new jubilant mood and relaxed with the food and drink in his belly. He talked to her as he had never talked to another human being, and she answered him with the frankness of another man. Oh, Mark, that's nonsense. Not every woman is sick. It's only the street girls. Yes, I know. I, I didn't believe every girl, but, well, they are the only ones that a man can... He broke off. And the others get babies he went on lamely. She laughed and clapped her hands with delight. Oh, my darling Mark, it's not that easy, you know. I've been married for nine years and I've never had a baby. Well, Mark hesitated. Well, you are different. I, I, I didn't mean you when I said those things. I, I meant other girls. I'm not sure if that's meant to be a, a compliment or an insult, she teased again. She had known he was a virgin, of course. There was that transparent, shining innocence that glowed from him, his unpractised and appealing awkwardness in the presence of women, that peculiar shyness that would pass so soon, but which now heightened her excitement, rousing her in some perverse way. She knew now why some men paid huge sums of money to despoil innocence. She touched his bared forearm now, delighting in the smooth hardness of young muscle, unable to keep her hands off him. Oh, it was a compliment! Mark answered her hurriedly. Do you like me, Mark? Oh, yes. I like you more than I've ever liked any other girl. You see, Mark, she leaned closer to him, her voice sinking to a throaty whisper. I'm not sick, and I'm not going to have a baby. Ever. She lifted her hand and touched his cheek. You are a beautiful man, Mark. I liked you from the first moment I saw you coming up the walk like a stray puppy. She stood up slowly and crossed to the kitchen door. Deliberately she turned the key and flipped up the light switch. The small room was dark, but for the shaft of light from the hallway. Come, Mark. She took his hand and drew him to his feet. We are going to bed now. 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 At the door to Mark's bedroom, she reached up on tiptoe and kissed his cheek lightly, and then, without another word, she let his hand drop and glided away from him.
Uncertainly, Mark watched her go, wanting to call to her to stay, wanting to run after her, and yet relieved that she had gone. And the headlong rush into the unknown had abruptly halted. She reached the door of her own bedroom and went through without looking back. Torn by conflicting emotions, he turned away and went through into his own room. He undressed slowly, disappointment now stronger than relief, and while he folded his clothing, he listened to her quiet movements in the room beyond the thin wall. He climbed at last into the narrow iron bed and lay rigid until he heard the light switch click next door. Then he sighed and picked up the book from his bedside table. He had not yet read it through, but now the dull political text might divert his emotions enough to allow him to sleep. The latch of his door snapped softly. He had not heard her in the passage, and she stepped into the room. She wore the gown of slippery peach-coloured satin, and she had recombed her hair and retouched her cheeks and lips. Carefully she closed the door and crossed the room with slow swaying hips under the moving satin. Neither of them spoke as she stopped by the side of his bed. Have you read it, Mark? she asked softly. Uh, not all of it, he placed the book aside. Well, this isn't the time to finish it, she said, and deliberately opened the gown slipped it from her shoulders, and dropped it over the back of the chair. She was naked, and Mark gasped. She was so smooth. He had not expected that somehow, and he stared at her as she stood close beside him. Her skin had an olive creaminess, like old porcelain, a sheen that caught the light and glowed. Mark felt his whole body rocked by the exquisite tension of arousal, and he tried feebly to thrust it aside. He tried to think of Fergus, of the trust that had been placed in him. Look after Helena, lad, and yourself. Her breasts were big for the slimness of her body. Already they hung heavily, almost overripe, drooping smooth and round with startlingly large nipples, rosy brown and big as ripe grapes. They swung weightily as she moved closer to him, and he saw that there were sparse dark hairs curling from the puckered oriole round the nipples. There was hair also curling out in little wisps from under her arms, dark, glossy hair, and a huge, wild bush of it below the smooth, creamy, slightly bulging belly. The hair excited him, so dark and crisp against the pale skin, and he stared at it, transfixed. All thoughts of honour and trust faded. He felt the damn wall inside him creak and strain. She reached out and touched his bare shoulder, and it convulsed his body like a whiplash. Touch me, Mark, she whispered and he reached out slowly, hesitantly, like a man in a trance, and touched with one finger the smooth, ivory warmth of her hip, still staring fixedly at her. Yes, Mark, that's right. She took his wrist and slowly drew his hand upwards, so that the tips of his fingers traced feather-like over her flank and the outlines of her ribs. Here, Mark, she said, and here. The big dark nipples contracted at the touch of his fingers, changing shape, thrusting out and hardening, swelling and darkening. Mark could not believe it was happening, that woman's flesh could react as swiftly and dramatically as a man's. He felt the dam break, and the flood came pouring through the breach, too long contained, too powerful and weighty to resist. It poured through his mind and body, sweeping all restraint before it. With a choking cry, he seized her around the waist with both arms and drew her fiercely to him, pressing his face into the smooth, soft warmth of her naked belly. Oh, Mark, she cried, and her voice was hoarse and shaking with lust and triumph, as she twisted her fingers into the soft brown hair and stooped over his head. The days blurred and telescoped together, and the universe shut down to a tiny cottage in a sordid street. Only their bodies marked the passage of time, sleeping and waking, to love until exhaustion overtook them and they slept again to wake hungry, ravenous for both food and loving. At first he was like a bull, charging with a mindless energy and strength. It frightened her, for she had not expected such strength from that slim and graceful body. She rode with his strength, little by little controlling and directing it, changing its course, and then she began gently to teach. Long afterwards Mark would think back on those five incredible days, and realise his great good fortune. 
So many young men must find their own way into the uncharted realms of physical lovemaking without guide, accompanied usually by a partner making her own hesitant first journey into the unknown. Did you know that there is a tribe in South America, Mark, that have a rule that every married woman must take one young warrior of the tribe and teach him to do what we are doing? she asked, as she knelt beside him in one of the intervals of quiet between the storms. What a shame, he smiled lazily. I thought we were the first two ever to think of it. He reached out for the pack of needlepoint cigarettes on the bedside table and lit two of them. Helena drew upon hers, and her expression was fond and proud. He had changed so swiftly and radically in the last few days, and she was responsible for that. This new assurance, this budding strength of purpose, the shyness and reticence were fading. He spoke now in a way that he had never spoken before, calmly and with authority. Swiftly he was becoming a full man and she had had a hand in it. Mark believed that each new delight was the ultimate one, but she proved him wrong a dozen times. There were things that, had he heard them spoken of, might have appalled and revolted him, but when they happened the way Helena made them happen, they left only wonder and a sense of awe. She taught him a vast new respect for his own body, as it came at last fully alive, and he became aware of new broad reaches and depths of his own mind. For five days neither of them left the cottage. Then, on the sixth day, there was a letter brought by a uniformed postman on a bicycle, and Mark, who accepted it, recognised immediately Fergus MacDonald's cramped and laboured hand. Guilt hit him like a fist in the stomach. The dream shattered like fragile crystal. Helena sat at the newspaper-covered table in the kitchen with the now-soiled peach gown open to the waist and read the letter aloud mocking the writer with the inflection of her voice as he reported a string of petty achievements, applause at party meetings where a dozen comrades had gathered in a back room, messages of loyalty and dedication to bring back to the Central Committee, commitment to the cause and promises of action when the time to strike was ripe. Helena mocked him, rolling her eyes and chuckling when he asked after Mark, was he well and happy? Was Helena looking after him properly? She drew deeply on the stub of the cigarette and then dropped it into the dregs of the coffee cup at her elbow, where it was extinguished with a sharp hiss. This simple action caused in Mark an unnatural reaction of revulsion. Suddenly he saw her clearly. The sallow skin wrinkled finely in the corners of her eyes as her youth cracked away like old oil paint, the plum-coloured underlining of the eye sockets the petulant quirk of her lips and the waspish sting to her voice. Abruptly he was aware of the squalid room, with the greasy smell of stale food and unwashed dishes, of the grubby and stained gown and the pendulous droop of the big ivory-coloured breasts beneath the gown. He stood up and left the room. Mark, where are you going? she called after him. I'm going out for a while. He scrubbed himself in the stained enamel bath running the water as hot as he could bear it, so that his body glowed bright pink as he toweled himself down. At the railway booking office he stood for nearly half an hour, reading the long lists of closely printed timetables pasted to the wall. Rhodesia. He had heard they needed men on the new copper mines. There was still a wilderness up there, far horizons and the great wild game, lakes and mountains and room to move. He moved to the window of the booking office, and the clerk looked out at him expectantly. One second-class single to Durban, he said, surprising himself. He was going back to Natal, to Ladyburg. There was unfinished business there, and answers to search for, an unknown enemy to find and confront. As he paid for the ticket with the old man's sovereigns, he had a vivid mental picture of the old man on the stoop of Andersland, with his great spiky whiskers, and the old Tarai hat pulled low over his pale, calm eyes. Mark knew then that this had been only a respite, a hiatus, in which he had found time to heal and gather courage for the task ahead. He went back to collect his belongings. There was not much to pack, and he was in a consuming hurry now. As he swept his few spare shorts and clean socks into the cardboard suitcase, he was suddenly aware of Helena's presence, and he turned quickly... She had bathed and dressed, and she stood in the doorway watching him, her expression too calm for the loneliness in her voice. You are going. It was a statement, not a question. Yes, he answered simply, turning to snap the catches on the case. I am coming with you. No, I am going alone. 
But, Mark, what about me? I am sorry, Helena. I am truly sorry. But don't you see? I love you! Her voice rose in a low wail of despair. I love you, Mark, darling. You can't go. She spread her arms to block the doorway. Please, Helena, we knew it was madness. We both knew there was nothing for us. Don't make it ugly now. Please let me go. No. She covered her ears with both hands. No, don't talk like that. I love you. I love you. Gently. He tried to move her from the doorway. I have to go. My train. Suddenly she flew at him, vicious as a wounded leopard. He was unprepared, and her nails raked long bloody lines across his face, narrowly missing his eyes. You bastard, you selfish bastard, she shrieked. You're like all of them. And she struck again, but he caught her wrists. You are all the same. You take, you take. He turned to her, wildly struggling, and tipped her back onto the unmade bed. Abruptly, the fight went out of her, and she pressed her face into the pillow. Her sobs followed Mark as he ran down the passage and out of the open front door. It was more than 300 miles to the port of Durban on the coast, and slowly the train huffed up the great barrier of the Drakensberg Mountains, worming its way through the passes until at last it plunged joyously over the escarpment and ran lightly down into the deep grassy bowl of the eastern littoral, dropping less steeply as it neared the sea, and emerged at last into the lush semi-tropical hothouse of the seaboard with its snowy white beaches and the warm blue waters of the Mozambique current. Mark had much time to think on the journey down, and he wasted most of it in vain regrets. Helena's cries and accusations echoed through his mind, while the cold grey stone of guilt lay heavily in the pit of his stomach whenever he thought of Fergus MacDonald. Then, as they passed through the town of Peter Maritzburg and began the last leg of the journey, Mark put aside his guilt and regret and began to think ahead. His first intention had been to return directly to Ladyburg, but now he realised that this was folly. There was an enemy there, a murderous enemy, a hidden enemy striking from cover, a rich enemy, a powerful enemy, who could command a bunch of armed men who were ready to kill. Mark thought then of those bloody attacks that he and Fergus had made in France. Always the first move had been to identify and mark the enemy, locate where he was lying, find his stance and assess him. How good was he? Was his technique rigid, or was he quick and changeable? Was he sloppy, so that the hunters could take risks, or were risks suicidal? We've got to try and guess the way the bastard's thinking, lad, was Fergus's first concern always before they planned the shoot. I've got to find out who he is, Mark whispered aloud, and guess the way the bastard is thinking. One thing at least was clear. A hundred pounds was too high a price in blood money for such an insignificant person as Mark Anders. The only thing that could possibly make him significant in any way was his relation to the old man and to Andersland. He had been seen at Andersland by both the Hindu Babu and the white foreman. Then he had brazened into the town asking questions, perusing documents, only then had they come after him. The land was the centre of the puzzle, and he had the names of all the men who had any interest in the sale. Mark lifted his suitcase down from the luggage rack, and holding it on his lap, hunted for and found his notebook. He read the names. Dirk Courtney, Ronald Pye, Dennis Peterson, Piet Hreling and his son Cornelius. His first concern must be to find out all he could about those men, Find out where each was lying, find his stance and assess him, decide which of them was the sniper. While he did this, he must keep his own head well down below the parapet. He must keep clear of enemy country, and enemy country was Ladyburg. His best base would be Durban City itself. It was big enough to absorb him without comment, and as the capital of Natal, he would have many sources of information there, libraries, government archives, newspaper offices. He began making a list of all possible sources in the back of the notebook, and immediately found himself regretting bitterly that Ladyburg itself was close to him. Records in the land's office and company registers for the district were not duplicated in the capital. Suddenly he had a thought. Damn it, what was her name? Mark closed his eyes, and he saw again the bright, friendly and cheerful face of the little girl in the company's office in Ladyburg. Mark, that's a strong romantic name. He could even hear her voice. 
but the train was sliding into the platform before her name came to him again. Marion! And he scribbled it into the notebook. He climbed down onto the platform, carrying his case, and joined the jostling throng of travellers and welcomers. Then he set out to find lodgings in the city. Lodgings in the city. Lodgings in the city. Lodgings in the city. A penny copy of the Natal Mercury led him through its small advertisements to a rooming house in Point Road, down by the docks. The room was small, dark, and smelled of those gargantuan cockroaches that infest the city, swarming up from the sewers each evening in shiny black hordes. But the rental was only a guinea a week, and he had the use of the lavatory and shower room across the small enclosed yard. Well, that night he wrote a letter. Dear Marion, I don't suppose you remember me. My name is Mark Anders, the same as Mark Antony. I have thought of you often since I was compelled to leave Ladyburg unexpectedly before I had a chance to see you again. Tactfully, he avoided any mention of the research work he wanted undertaken. That could wait for the next letter. He had learned much about women recently, and he addressed the letter simply to Miss Marion, the company registrar's office, Ladyburg. Mark started the following morning at the city library, walking up Smith Street to the four-storied edifice of the municipal buildings. It looked like a palace flanked by the equally imposing buildings of the Royal Hotel and the Cathedral, with the garden square neatly laid out in front of it, bright with spring blooms. He had another inspiration as he approached the librarian's desk. I'm doing research for a book I intend writing. Immediately the grey-haired lady, who presided over the dim halls and ceiling-high racks of books, softened her severe expression. She was a book person, and book people love other book people. Mark had the key to one of the reading rooms given him, and the back copies of all the Natal newspapers going back to the time of the first British occupation were put at his disposal. There was immediately a temptation for Mark, voracious reader that he was, to lose himself in the fascination of history printed as urgent headlines for history had been one of Mark's favourite subjects, both at Ladyburg School and at the University College. He resisted the temptation and went at once to the drawers that contained the copies of the Ladyburg Lantern and Recorder. The first copies were already yellowing with age and tore easily, so he handled them with care. The first mention of the name Courtney leapt at him in thick black headlines on one of the earliest copies from 1879. Ladyburg Mounted Rifles Massacre at Ishlanzwana. Colonel Waite Courtney and his men cut down to a man, blood-crazed impies on the rampage. Mark guessed that this must refer to the founder of the family in Ladyburg. After that, the name cropped up in nearly every issue. There were many Courtneys, and all of them lived in the Ladyburg district. But the first mention of Dirk Courtney came in 1900. Ladyburg welcomes one of its favourite sons, Hero of the Anglo-Boer War returns. Colonel Sean Courtney purchases Lion Cop Ranch. Lady Berg welcomes the return of one of her favourite sons after an absence of many years. There are very few of us who are not acquainted with the exploits of Colonel Sean Courtney, DSO, DCM, and all will recall the major role he played in the establishment of the prosperous gold mining industry on the Witwatersrand. A long recital of the man's deeds and reputation followed, and the report ended. Colonel Courtney has purchased the ranch lion cop from the Ladyburg Farmers Bank. He intends making this his home and will plant the land to timber. Major Courtney is a widower and is accompanied by his ten-year-old son, Dirk. The ancient report shocked Mark. He had not realised that Dirk Courtney was the son of his old general. The big bearded hook-nosed man he had met that snowy night in France the man who he immediately respected and liked, no, more than liked, the man whose vital force and presence together with his reputation had roused in him an almost religious awe. His instant reaction was to wonder if the general himself was in any way involved in the murderous attack he had survived on the escarpment. And the thought disturbed him, so that he had left the library and went down to the palm-lined esplanade and found a bench overlooking the quiet sheltered waters of the bay, with the great whale-back mountain of the bluff beyond. He watched the shipping as he pondered the tangled web that was centred in Ladyburg, where the hidden spider sat. He knew that his investigations were going to take time. The reading was a slow business, and it would be days before he could expect to have a reply to his letter to Marion. Later, in his dingy room, he counted the remaining sovereigns in his money-belt and knew that living in the city 
they would not last him long. He needed a job. The floor manager had the beer belly and flash clothing that seemed always to go with salesmen in the motor industry. Mark answered his questions with extreme politeness and a false cheerfulness, but with despair below the surface. He had trudged the city for five days from one faint prospect of work to another. Times are hard, almost every prospective employer told him at the beginning of the interview, and we are looking for a man with experience. Mark had no time to pursue his quest at the library. Now he sat on the front edge of his chair waiting to thank the man and say goodbye as soon as he was dismissed. But the man went on talking long after he should have closed the interview. He was talking about the salesman's commission and how it was so generous that there were plenty for two. If you know what I mean, the man winked and fitted a cigarette into his ivory holder. Yes, yes, of course, Mark nodded vehemently, having absolutely no idea what the man meant, but eager to please. Of course I'd be looking after you personally, if we came to some sort of arrangement, right? Uh, right, Mark agreed, and only then did he realise that the manager was soliciting a kickback off Mark's commission. He was going to get the job. Uh, of course, sir, he wanted to leap up and dance. I'd like to think we were equal partners. Good. Fifty percent of Mark's commission was more than the manager had expected. Start Monday, nine o'clock sharp, he said quickly, and beamed at Mark. Mark wrung his hand gratefully. But as he was leaving the little cubicle of the office, the manager called after him. You do have a decent suit, Anders, don't you? Of course, Mark lied quickly. Well, wear it. He found a Hindu tailor at the Indian market who ran up a grey three-piece suit overnight and charged him thirty-two shillings. You wear clothes beautifully, sir, like a royal duke, the tailor told him, as he pointed Mark at the fly-blown mirror in his fitting room standing behind him and skilfully holding a fold of surplus material at the small of Mark's back to give the front of the suit a fashionable drape. You'll be an extremely first-class advertisement for my humble skills. You can drive a car, of course, the manager, whose name was Dickie Lankham, asked him casually as they crossed the showroom floor to the glistening Cadillac. Uh, uh, of course, Mark agreed. Of course, Dickie agreed. Otherwise you wouldn't have applied for the job as a car salesman, would you? Uh, of course not. Well, hop in then, Dickie invited, and whip us around the block. Mark reeled mentally, but his tongue was quick enough to rescue him. I'd prefer you to point out the special features first. I've never driven a Cadillac before. Which was for once the literal truth. He had never driven a Cadillac or any other motor vehicle before. Rightio, Dickie agreed. And as they sped down the marine parade, with Dickie whistling and tipping his hat to the pretty girls on the sidewalk, Mark watched his every action with wheel and pedal avidly. Back at the showrooms in West Street, Dickie flicked casually through a bunch of forms. If you make a sale, you fill in one of these, and make sure you get the money. Then he pulled out his watch. God, it's late. I've got a desperately important lunch date. It was a little after eleven o'clock. Very important client. Then he dropped his voice. Blonde, actually. Smasher. And he winked again. See you later. Uh, but uh, what about prices and that sort of thing? Mark called desperately after him. Ach, there's a pamphlet on my desk. Gives you all that stuff. Ta-da! And Dickie disappeared through the back door. Mark was circling the Cadillac uncertainly, utterly engrossed with the pamphlet, muttering aloud as he tried to master the operating instructions and identify the various component parts of the vehicle from the line-drawing and numerated list, when there was a tap on his arm. "'Excuse me, young man, but are you the salesman?' Before him stood an elderly couple, the man dressed in beautifully tailored dark cloth, a carnation in his buttonhole and a cane in one hand. "'We would like a drive in the motor vehicle before we decide.' said the elegant lady beside him, smiling at Mark in a motherly fashion, through the light veil that draped down over her eyes from the brimmed hat. The hat was decorated with artificial flowers, and her hair below the brim was washed silver and neatly waved. Mark felt waves of panic threaten to engulf him. He looked about desperately for an escape, but already the gentleman was handing his wife into the front seat of the Cadillac. Mark closed the doors on the couple, and ducked behind the machine for one last brief perusal of the operating pamphlet. Depress the clutch pedal with left foot, engage gear lever up and left, depress accelerator pedal firmly with right foot, release clutch pedal, he muttered, 
stuffed the pamphlet into his pocket and hurried to the driver's seat. The gentleman sat forward in the centre of the back seat, both hands resting on the head of his cane, grave and attentive as a judge. His wife beamed kindly at Mark. How old are you, young man? Uh, Twenty, ma'am. Almost twenty-one. Mark pressed the starter and the engine growled. So she had to raise her voice. My! She nodded. The same age as my own son. Mark gave her a pale and sickly grin as he silently repeated the instructions in his mind. Accelerate firmly. The engine beat rose to a deafening bellow and Mark clung to the driving wheel until the knuckles of both hands blanched with the pressure of his grip. Do you live at home? asked his passenger. No, ma'am. Mark answered and let out the clutch. The back wheel screeched like a wounded stallion, and a blue cloud blew out from behind as the entire machine seemed to rear upwards and then hurl itself slewing wildly towards the street doors, leaving two long black rubber smears across the polished showroom floor. Mark fought the wheel, and the Cadillac swayed and skidded, lined up with the doors at the last possible moment, and careered into the street, moving sideways like a crab. A team of horses drawing a passing coach shied out of the path of the roaring machine, and behind Mark, the elderly gentleman managed to struggle up into a sitting position again and find his cane. "'Good acceleration!' Mark shouted above the roar of the engine. "'Excellent!' agreed his passenger, his eyes popping in the rearview mirror. His wife adjusted her flowered hat that had come down over her eyes and shook her head sadly. "'You young boys, as soon as you leave home, you starve yourselves!' I could tell you're living on your own. You're as thin as... Mark took the intersection of Smith and Allowell at the charge, but halfway through it, a heavily laden lorry lumbered across their front, and Mark spun the wheel nimbly. The Cadillac changed direction 90 degrees and ducked into Allowell on two wheels. Thin as a rake, said the lady, holding firmly to the door handle with one hand and with the other to her hat. You should come up to the house one Sunday for a decent meal. Thank you, ma'am. That's very kind. When Mark stopped the Cadillac against the pavement in front of the showrooms at last, his hand was shaking so feverishly that he had to make a second effort to earth the magneto. He could feel the damp of nervous sweat soaking through the jacket of his new suit, and he had not the strength to let himself out of the cab. Incredible, said the elderly gentleman in the back seat. What control, what mastery! I feel quite young again. It was very nice, dear, his wife agreed. We'll take her her husband decided impulsively, and Mark could not believe he had heard right. He had made his first sale. "'Wouldn't it be nice if this young man would come to us as a chauffeur? He is such an excellent driver.' "'Oh, no, ma'am. Mark nearly panicked again. "'I couldn't think of leaving my job here. Thank you all the same.' "'Jolly good show, old man,' Dicky Lankham folded the two five-pound notes that were his half-share of Mark's commission on the sale of the Cadillac. "'I can see a great future ahead for you.' Oh, I don't know, Mark demurred modestly. A great future, Dickie predicted sagely. Uh, but just one thing, old man, that, um, that suit, he shuddered gently. Let me introduce you to my tailor, uh, now that you can afford it. No offence, of course, but uh, that looks like you're uh, on your way to a fancy dress ball. That evening, after close of business, Mark hurried back to the library for the first time in a week. The librarian welcomed him with a severe expression, like a disapproving schoolmaster. Thought we'd seen the last of you, that you'd given up. Oh, no, 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 by no means, Mark assured her. And again she softened and handed him the key to the reading room. Mark had mapped out a family tree for the Courtenays in his notebook, for it was confusing. There was a brother to Sean, who was also a colonel at the end of the Boer War, but also a holder of the Victoria Cross for gallantry, a distinguished family indeed. This brother, Colonel Garrick Courtney, had gradually become a noted and then a famous author of military history and of biographies of other successful soldiers, beginning with his With Roberts to Pretoria and Buller, a fighting soldier, and going on to Battle for the Somme and Kitchener, a life. The books were all extensively and glowingly reviewed in the lantern. The author had a single son, Michael Courtney. Prior to 1914, there were references to this son's business activities as managing director of the Courtney Sawmills in the Ladyburg district and his skills as an athlete and horseman in many local meetings. Then, 1917, 
Ladybug hero decorated. Hero decorated. Hero decorated. Hero decorated. Captain Michael Courtney, son of Colonel Garrick Courtney, V.C., was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross for his exploits with the 21st RFC Fighter Squadron in France. Captain Courtney has been credited with five kills of German aircraft and was described by his commanding officer as a courageous and dedicated officer of high-flying skills. Hero, son of hero. Then again, within months, a front-page article outlined in a square of heavy black type. It is with great regret that we report the death in action of Captain Michael Courtney, DFC. It is believed that Captain Courtney was shot down in flames behind enemy lines and that his executioner was none other than the notorious Baron von Richthofen of bloody reputation. The Ladyburg Lantern extends its deepest and sincerest condolences to his father and family. A rose plucked in full bloom. The activities of this branch of the family, its triumphs and tragedies, were all reported in detail, and it was the same with the Sean Courtney family for the period from the turn of the century to May of 1910. Sean Courtney's marriage to Mrs Ruth Friedman of 1903 was described in loving detail, from the bride's dress to the icing on the cake. One of the flower girls was Miss Storm Friedman, aged four, who wore an exact replica of her mother's dress. She makes a pretty new sister for Master Dirk Courtney. Again, the mention of the name that truly interested Mark, and he noted it, for it was the last until May the 1910. Colonel Sean Courtney's achievements in politics and business and the more serious fields of recreation filled page after page of subsequent editions. His election to the Legislative Council of Natal and later to Prime Minister Louis Boerter's cabinet. He became leader of the South Africa Party in Natal and was a delegate to Whitehall in London, taking his entire family with him to negotiate the terms of union. Sean Courtney's business interests flourished and multiplied. New sawmills, new plantations, elevation to new offices, the chairman of the first building society in Southern Africa, director of Union Castle Shipping Lines, head of the Government Commission on Natural Resources, chairman of the South African Turf Club, a 150-foot luxury yacht built for him by Thiessens of Neisner, Commodore of the Royal Natal Yacht Club, but no further mention of Dirk Courtney until May 1910. The Ladyburg Lantern and Recorder's front page of the edition of the 12th of May 1910. The Ladyburg Lantern takes great pleasure in announcing that its entire paid-up share capital has been acquired by Mr Dirk Courtney, who recently returned to Ladyburg after an absence of some years. Mr. Courtney tells us that the intervening years have been spent in travel, gaining both experience and capital. Clearly they were not wasted, for immediately on his arrival home, Mr. Courtney purchased a controlling interest in the Ladyburg Farmers Bank for a reputed £1 million sterling in cash. Ladyburg and all its inhabitants are sure to benefit enormously by the vast energy, wealth and drive that Mr. Dirk Courtney brings to the district. I intend taking a close day-to-day -day interest in all aspects of my company's operations in Ladyburg, he said, when asked of his future plans. Progress, growth, prosperity for all are my watchwords. Mr. Dirk Courtney, the Ladyburg Lantern salutes you and welcomes you as a notable ornament to our fair community. After that, hardly an addition of the Lantern did not contain fawning eulogies of Mr. Dirk Courtney, while mention of his father and family was reduced to an occasional small article in the inside pages. To find news of Sean Courtney, Mark had to turn to the other Natal newspapers. He began with the Natal Mercury. Ladyburg Mounted Rifles sails for France. General Courtney takes his men to war once more. That jolted Mark. He could remember the sea mist on the bay and the ranks of khaki-clad figures climbing the gangways, each of them burdened by kit bag and rifle, the singing and the cries of the women, paper streamers and flower petals twisting and falling in gay and gaudy clouds about them, and the sound of the foghorns reverberating mournfully from the bluff. It was so clear in his mind still. How soon he was to follow them, after exaggerating his age to a recruiting sergeant who did not inquire too closely. Ladyburg rifles badly mauled. Attack fails at Delville Wood. General Courtney, I am proud of them. Mark felt sudden stinging tears burn his eyelids 
as he went slowly down the long casualty lists, pausing as he recognised a name, remembering, remembering, lost again in those terrible seas of mud and blood and suffering. A hand touched his shoulder, arousing him, and he straightened up from the reading table, bewildered at his sudden return to the present. Uh, we are closing now. It's after nine o'clock, said the young assistant librarian softly. I'm afraid you'll have to leave now. Then she peered more closely at him. Are you all right? Have you been crying? Uh, uh, no. Quickly, Mark groped for his handkerchief. It's just the strain of reading. His landlady shouted down the stairs to him as he let himself into the hall. I got a letter for you. The letter looked as thick as a complete works of William Shakespeare. But when he opened it, there were only twenty-two pages. Beginning... My dear Mark, of course I remember you so clearly, and I have thought about you often, wondering whatever had become of you. So your welcome letter came as a marvellous surprise. Mark felt a guilty twinge at the unrestrained joy that her letter voiced. I realised that we know so little about each other. You did not even know my name. Well, it's Marion Littlejohn. Silly name, isn't it? I wish I could change it. That's not a hint, silly. And I was born in Ladyburg. I'm not going to tell you when. A lady never reveals her age. My father was a farmer, but he sold his farm five years ago, and now he works as a foreman at the sugar mill. The entire family history. Marion's schooling, the names and estates of all her numerous relatives. Marion's hopes, dreams and aspirations. I'd love to travel, wouldn't you? Paris, London, were all laid out in detail. Much of it in parenthesis and liberally punctuated with exclamation and question marks. Isn't it strange that our names are so similar, Mark and Marion? It does sound rather grand, doesn't it? Mark had stirrings now of alarm. It seemed he had called the whirlwind when he had merely whistled for a breeze, and yet there was an infectious gaiety and warmth that came through to him strongly, and he regretted that the girl's features were so hazy in his mind. He realised that he might easily pass her in the street without recognising her. He replied that night, taking special care with his penmanship. He could not yet blatantly come to the true purpose of his letters, but hinted vaguely that he was considering writing a book, but that it would require much research in the Ladyburg archives, and that as yet he did not have either the time nor the capital to make the journey. And he concluded by wondering if she did not have a photograph of herself that he might have. Her reply must have been written and posted the same day as his letter was received. My dearest Mark, he had been promoted from dear Mark. There was a photograph accompanying the twenty-five pages of closely written text. It was stiffly posed, a young girl in party clothes, with a fixed nervous smile on her face, staring into the camera as though it were the muzzle of a loaded howitzer. The focus was slightly misty, but it was good enough to remind him what she looked like, and Mark felt a huge swell of relief. She was a little plump, but she had a sweet heart-shaped face with a wide, friendly mouth and well-spaced, intelligent eyes, an alert and lively look about her, and he knew already that she was educated and reasonably well-read, and desperately eager to please. On the back of the photograph he had received further promotion. To Darling Mark, with much love, Marion. Under her name were three neat crosses. The letter was bursting with unbounded admiration for his success as a Cadillac salesman, and with awe for his aspirations to be a writer. She was anxious to be of help in his researches. He had only to let her know what information he needed. She herself had access to all the governmental and municipal archives, and I won't charge you a search fee this time. Her elder sister worked in the editorial office of the Lady Lantern, and there was an excellent library in the town hall building where Marion was well known and where she loved to browse. Please would he let her help. One other thing, did he have a photograph of himself? She would love to have a reminder of him. For half a crown, Mark had a photograph taken of himself at a beachfront open-air studio, dressed in his new suit, and with a straw boater cantered at a rakish angle over one eye and a daredevil grin on his face. My darling Mark, how handsome you are! I have shown all my friends, and they are all quite envious. She had some of the information he requested, and more would follow. From Adams Booksellers in Smith Street, Mark purchased a bulky leather-bound notebook, 
three enormous sheets of cardboard and a large-scale survey map of Natal and Zululand. These he pinned up on the walls of his room, where he could study them while lying in bed. On one sheet he laid out the family trees of the Courtenays, the Pies and the Petersons, all three names associated with the purchase of Andersland on the documents he had seen in the Ladyburg Deeds Office. On one other sheet he built up a pyramid of companies and holdings controlled by the Ladyburg Farmers Bank, and on another he pyramided, in the same way, the companies and properties of General Sean Courtney's holding company, Natal Timber and Estates Limited. On the map he carefully shaded in the actual land holdings of the two groups, red for General Courtney and blue for those controlled by his son, Dirk Courtney Esquire. It gave him new resolution and determination to continue his search when he carefully shaded with blue the long, irregular shape of Andersland with its convoluted boundary that followed the south bank of the river. And when he had done so and wiped the crayon from his fingers, he was left with the bitter lees of anger in his mouth, a reaffirmation of his conviction that the old man would never have let it go. They would have had to kill him first. The anger was with him again whenever he filled in another section of the map, or when he lay in bed each night, smoking a last cigarette and studying the blue and red patchwork of Courtney Holdings. He smiled grimly when he thought what Fergus MacDonald would say about such wealth in the hands of a single father and son. And then he wrote in the leather-bound notebook any new information that he had accumulated during the day. He would switch out the light then and lie long awake and often, when at last he slept, he dreamed of Charka's gate, of the great cliffs guarding the river, and the tumbled wilderness beyond the gates that concealed a lonely grave, a grave unmarked, overgrown now with the lush, restless vegetation of Africa, or perhaps long ago dug open by hyena or the other scavengers. One day, when Mark spent his customary evening study in the library reading room, he turned first to the recent issues of the Ladyburg Lantern, searching through those editions covering the week following his flight from Ladyburg, and he almost missed the few lines on an inside page. Yesterday the funeral service was held of Mr. Jacob Henry Rousseau at the Methodist Church in Pine Street. Mr. Rousseau fell to his death in the gorge of the Baboonstrom below the new railway bridge while hunting with a party of his friends. Mr. Rousseau was a bachelor employed by the Zululand Sugar Company Limited. The funeral service was attended by the chairman of the company, Mr. Dirk Courtney, who made a short but moving tribute at the graveside, once again illustrating his deep concern for even the humblest of the employees of his many prosperous enterprises. Greatness shows itself in small ways. The date coincided neatly with his escape from the valley. The man might have been one of his hunters, perhaps the one who had caught his damaged ankle as he hung from the goods truck. If he was, then the connection with Dirk Courtney was direct. Slowly Mark was twisting a rope together, but he needed a head for the noose. Yet in one direction Mark felt easier. There seemed to exist a deep rift between father and son, between General Sean Courtney and Dirk. None of their companies overlapped, none of their directorships interlocked and each pyramid of companies stood alone and separated. This separation seemed to extend beyond finance or business, and Mark had found no evidence of any contact between the two men at the social level. In fact, active hostility between them was indicated by the sudden change in the Ladyburg Lantern's attitude to the father, once the son took control of its editorial policy. Yet he was not entirely convinced. Fergus MacDonald had repeatedly warned him of the perfidious cunning of the bosses, of all wealthy men. They'll go to any lengths to hide their guilt, Mark. No trick is too low or despicable to cover the stains of honest workers' blood on their hands. Perhaps Mark's first concern must be to establish beyond doubt that he was hunting only one man. And then, of course, the next move must be to go back to Ladyburg to try and provoke another attack. But this time he'd be ready for it and have some idea from which direction it would come. His mind went back to the way in which he and Fergus MacDonald had used Cuthbert, the dummy, to draw fire and force the enemy to reveal himself, and he grinned ruefully at the thought that this time he must do Cuthbert's job himself. He felt for the first time a fear he had not known in France before a shoot. For he must go out against something more formidable and ruthless than he had ever believed possible before. And the time was fast approaching, fast approaching, fast approaching.
fast approaching. Mark was distracted by another massive epistle from Ladyburg, one that gave him honest cause for delaying direct action. My dearest darling, what great news I have for you. If the mountain will not come to Mahomet, then he, or she, must go to the mountain. My sister and her husband are going to Durban for four days' holiday, and they have asked me to join them. We will arrive on the 14th, and will be staying at the Marine Hotel on the Marine Parade. Won't we be posh? Mark surprised himself by the strength of his pleasure and anticipation. He had not realised the affection that he had slowly accumulated at such long remove for this willing and friendly creature. He was surprised again when he met her, both of them dressed with obvious pains and attention to detail, both in an agony of shyness and restraint under the surveillance of Marion's sister. They sat on the hotel veranda and stiffly sipped tea, making small talk with the sister while surreptitiously examining each other over the rim of their cups. Marion had lost weight, Mark saw immediately, but would never know that the girl had almost starved herself to do so in anticipation of this moment. And she was pretty, much prettier than he remembered, or than her photographs suggested. More important was her transparent wholesomeness and warmth. Mark had been a lonely boy for most of his life, but more particularly so in these last weeks, living in his small, dingy room with only the cockroaches and his plans for company. Now he reacted to her like a traveller coming in out of the snowstorm responds to the tavern fire. The sister took her duties as chaperone seriously at first, but she was only five or six years older than Mark and perceptive enough to be aware of the young people's attraction for each other and to recognise the essential decency of the boy. She was also young enough and herself so recently married as to have sympathy for them. I would like to take Marion for a drive. We wouldn't be gone very long. Marion turned eyes as soulful and pleading as those of a dying gazelle on her sister. Oh, please, Lynn. The Cadillac was a demonstration model, and Mark had personally supervised while two of the Zulu employees at Natal Motors had burnished its paintwork to a dazzle. He drove down as far as the mouth of the Amgheni River, with Marion sitting close and proud and pretty beside him. Mark felt as good as he ever had in his life. Dressed in fashionable style, with gold in his pocket, a big shining automobile under him and a pretty, adoring girl beside him. Adoring was the only word to describe Marion's attitude towards him. She could hardly drag her eyes from his face for a moment, and she glowed every time he glanced across at her. She had never imagined herself beside such a handsome, sophisticated beau. Not even her most romantic daydreams had ever included a shining Cadillac and a decorated war hero. When he parked off the road, and they picked a path through the densely overgrown dunes down to the river mouth, she clung to his arm like a drowning sailor. The river was in spate from some upland rainstorm. Half a mile wide and muddy brown as coffee, it surged and swirled down to meet the green thrust of the sea in a leaping ridge of white water. Carried down on the brown water were the debris of the flood and the carcasses of drowned beasts. A dozen big black sharks were there to scavenge, pushing high up the river, their dark triangular fins knifing and circling. Mark and Marion sat side by side on a dune overlooking the estuary. Oh, sighed Marion, as though her heart would break. We've only got four days together. Four days is a long time, Mark laughed at her. I don't know what we're going to do with it all. They spent nearly every hour of it together. Dickie Lankham was most understanding with his star salesman. Just show your face here for a few minutes every morning to keep the boss happy, then you can slip off. I'll hold the fort for you. Or what about the demonstration model? Mark asked boldly. I'll tell him you're making a sale to a rich sugar farmer. Take it, old chap, but for God's sake, don't wrap it round a tree. I don't know how I'll ever repay you, Dickie. Really, I don't. Oh, don't worry, old boy, we'll think of a way. I won't ask again. It's just that this girl is really special. I understand. Dickie patted his shoulder in a paternal fashion. Most important thing in life. A likely bit of crumpet. My heart goes out to you, old son. I'll be cheering you on in spirit every inch of the way. It's, it's not like that, Dickie, Mark denied, blushing fiercely. Of course not, it never is, but enjoy it anyway. And Dickie winked lasciviously. Mark and Marion. She was right, it did sound rather grand. Spent their days wandering hand in hand through the city, 
She was delighted by its bustle and energy, enchanted by its sophistication, by its culture, its museums and tropical gardens, by its playground beachfront with myriad fairy lights, the open-air concerts in the gardens of the old fort, by the big departmental stores in West Street, Stutterford's and Anstey's, their windows packed with expensive imported merchandise, by the docks with great merchant ships lining the wharf and the steam cranes huffing and creaking above them. They watched the Indian fishermen running their surf boats out from the glistening white beach through the marching lines of green surf to lay their long nets in a wide semicircle out into the deep water. Then Marion hitched up her skirts and Mark rolled his trousers to the knee to help the half-naked fishermen draw in the long lines until at last a shimmering silver mound of fish lay on the boat still quivering and twitching and leaping in the sunlight. They ate strawberry-flavoured ice cream out of crisp yellow cones, and they rode in an open rickshaw down the marine parade, drawn by a leaping, howling Zulu dressed in an incredible costume of feathers and beads and horns. One night they joined Dickie Lankham, and a languid siren to whom he was paying court, and the four of them ate grilled crayfish and danced to a jazz band at the Oyster Box Hotel at Umschlanger Rocks, and came roaring home in a Cadillac, tiddly and happy and singing, with Dickie driving like Nuvarelli, rocketing the big car over the dusty, rutted road, and Mark and Marion cuddling blissfully in the back seat. In the lobby of the hotel, under the watchful eye of the night clerk, who was poised to intercept Mark if he tried for the elevator, they whispered good night to each other. I've never been so happy in all my life, she told him simply, and stood on tiptoe to kiss him full on the lips. Dickie Lankham had disappeared with both Cadillac and Lady Friend, probably to some dark and secluded parking place along the seafront. And as Mark walked home, alone through the deserted midnight streets, he thought about Marion's words and found himself agreeing. He could not remember being so happy either. But then he grinned ruefully. It hadn't been a life crowded with wild happiness up to then. To a pauper, a shilling is a fortune. It was their last day together and the knowledge weighted their pleasure with poignancy. Mark left the Cadillac at the end of a narrow track in the sugarcane fields, and they climbed down to the long white curve of snowy sand beach, guarded at each end by rocky headlands. The sea was so clear that from the tall dunes they could see deep down to the reefs and sculptured sandbanks below the surface. Further out, the water shaded to a deep indigo blue that met at last a far horizon piled with a mountainous range of cumulus clouds, purple, blue and silver in the brilliant sunlight. They walked down barefooted through the crunching sand, carrying the picnic basket that Marion's hotel had prepared for them and a threadbare grey blanket from Mark's bed, and it seemed that they were the only two persons in the whole world. They changed into swimming costumes, modestly separating to each side of a dense, dark green milkwood bush, and then they ran laughing into the warm, clear water at the edge of the beach. The thin black cotton of Marion's costume clung wetly to her body, so that it seemed that she were naked, although clothed from mid-thigh to neck, and when she pulled the red rubber bathing cap from her head and shook out the thick tresses of her hair, Mark found himself physically roused by her for the first time. Somehow the pleasure he had taken in her up until then had been that of friendship and companionship, her patent adoration had filled some void in his soul, and he had felt protective, almost brotherly, towards her. She sensed instantly, with some feminine instinct, the change in him. The laughter died on her lips, and her eyes went grave, and there were shades in them of fear or apprehension. But she turned to face him, lifting her face to him, seeming to steel herself with a conscious act of courage. They lay side by side on the grey blanket, in the heavy shade of the milk bush and the midday was heavy and languorous with heat and the murmur of insects. The wet bathing suits were cool against their hot skins, and when Mark gently peeled hers away, her skin was damp beneath his fingers, and he was surprised to find her body so different from Helena's. Her skin was clear milky white, tipped with palest pink, lightly sugared with white beach sand, and the hair of her body was fine as silk, light golden brown and soft as smoke. Her body was soft also, with the gentle yielding spring of woman's flesh, unlike the lean, hard muscle of Helena's. And it had a different feel to it, a plasticity that intrigued and excited him. Only when she gasped and bit her lip and then turned her face and hid it against his neck did Mark realise suddenly through the mists of his own arousal 
that all the skills Helena had taught him were not moving Marion as they were him. Her body was rigid and her face pale and tensed. Marion, are you all right? Uh, it's all right, Mark. You don't like this. It, it's the first time it's ever happened. Oh, we can stop. No. Oh, we don't have to. No, no, no Mark, go on. It, it's what you want. But you don't want it. I, I want what you want, Mark. Go on, it's for you. No. Go on, Mark. Please, go on. And now she looked at him, and he saw her expression was pitiful, her eyes swimming with bright tears and her lips quivering. Oh, Marion, I'm sorry. He recoiled from her, horrified by the misery he saw reflected in her expression. But immediately she followed him, throwing both arms around his neck, lying half on top of him. No, Mark, don't be sorry. I want you to be happy. It won't make me happy, if you don't want to. Oh, Mark, don't say that. Please don't say that. All I want in the world is to make you happy. She was brave and enduring, holding him tightly over her, both arms locked around his neck, her body rigid but spread compliantly. And for Mark, the ordeal was almost as painful. He suffered for her as he felt the tremble of locked nerves and the small sounds of pain and tension that she tried to keep deep in her throat. Mercifully for both of them, it was swiftly ended, but still she clung to him. What Was it good for you, Mark, my darling? Oh, yes, he assured her vehemently. It was wonderful. I want so much to be good for you in every way, my darling. Always and in every way I want to be good for you. It was the best thing in my life, he told her, and she stared into his eyes for a moment, searching for assurance, and finding it because she wanted it so terribly. I'm so glad, darling, she whispered, and drew his head down to her damp, warm bosom, so soft and pink and comforting. Holding him like that, she began to rock him gently, the way a mother rocks her child. I'm so glad, Mark, and it'll be better and better. I'll learn, you see if I don't, and I'll try so hard for you, darling, always. Driving home slowly in the dusk, she sat proudly next to him on the wide leather seat, and there was a new air about her, an air of confidence and achievement, as though she had grown from child to matron in the space of a few short hours. Mark felt a rush of deep affection for her. He felt that he wanted to protect her, to keep that goodness and sweetness from souring, to protect her from unhappiness and wanton damage. For a fleeting moment he felt regret that she had not been able to feed that raging madness of his body, and regret also that he had not been able to lead her through the storm to the same peace. Perhaps that would come. Perhaps they would find the way together. And if they didn't, well, it wasn't that important. The important thing was the sense of duty he felt towards this woman. She had given him everything of which she was capable, and it was his duty now to give back in equal measure, to protect and cherish her. Marion, will you marry me? he asked quietly. And she began to cry softly, nodding her head vehemently through the tears, unable to speak. Marion's sister, Lynette, was married to a young lawyer from Ladyburg, and the four of them sat up late that night discussing the betrothal. Pa won't give permission for you to marry before you're twenty-one. You know how Peter and I had to wait. Peter Burtus, a serious young man, nodded wisely and placed his fingertips together carefully. He had thin, sandy hair and was as pompous as a judge in scarlet. It won't do any harm to wait a few years. Years, wailed Marion. Well, you're only nineteen, Peter reminded her, and Mark will need to build up some capital before he takes on the responsibility of a family. I can go on working, Marion came in hotly. They all say that, Peter waggled his head sagely, and then two months later there's a baby on the way. Peter, his wife rebuked him primly, but he went on calmly. And now, Mark, what about your prospects? Marion's father will want to know. Mark hadn't expected to present an account of his affairs and on the spur of the moment he could not be certain if his total worth was £42.12 shillings or seven and sixpence. He saw them off on the Ladyburg train the next morning, with a long, lingering embrace and a promise to write every day, while Marion swore she would work at filling her bottom drawer and at altering her father's prejudice against early marriage. Walking back from the railway, Mark remembered for no apparent reason a spring morning in France coming back out of the line to go into reserve, and his shoulders went back 
and his step quickened and became springy and elastic once more. He was out of the line, and he had survived. That was as far as he could think at that moment. Dickie Lankham's polished elastic-sided boots were propped on the desk in front of him and fastidiously crossed at the ankles. He looked up from his newspaper, a teacup held in the other hand with little finger extended delicately. Hail the conquering hero comes, his wary weapon slung over his shoulder. Oh, come on, Dickie. Weak at the knees, bloodshot eye and fevered brow. Any calls? Mark asked seriously. Ah, the giant mind now turns to the more mundane aspects of life. Play the game, Dickie. Mark riffled quickly through a small pile of messages that awaited him. A surfeit of love, a plethora of passion, an overdose of crumpet, a genital hangover. What's this? I can't read your scrawl. Mark averted his eyes, concentrating on his reading. Mark my words, Mark, that young lady has got the brood lust. If you turn your back on her for ten minutes, she'll be up the nearest tree building a nest. Oh, cut it out, Dickie. That's precisely what you should do, old boy, unless you can face the prospect of her dropping your whelps all over the scenery. Dicky shuddered theatrically. Never ride in a saloon if you can drive a sports model, old chap. Oh, which reminds me, he dropped the newspaper, checked the watch from his waistcoat pocket. I, um, I have this important client, he inspected his glossy boots a moment, flicked them lightly with the handkerchief from his breast pocket, stood up and adjusted the straw basher on his head and winked at Mark. Her husband's gone up country for a week. Hold the fort, old boy, it's my turn now. He disappeared through the office door into the showroom and then reappeared instantly, an expression of horror on his face. Oh, God, customers, get after them, Mark, my boy. I'm taking the back door. And he was gone, leaving only the faint perfume of brilliantine lingering on the air. Mark checked his tie in the sliver of broken mirror wedged in the frame of the window and adjusted his welcoming smile as he hurried to the door. But at the threshold he stopped as though coming up at the end of a chain. He was listening with the stillness and concentration of a wild gazelle, listening with every fibre and every quivering nerve end to a sound of such aching and penetrating beauty that it seemed to freeze his heart. It lasted only a few seconds, but the sound of it shimmered and thrilled in the air for long seconds afterwards, and only then did Mark's heart beat again, surging heavily against his ribcage. The sound was the laughter of a girl. It was as though the air around Mark had thickened to honey, for it dragged heavily at his legs as he started forward, and it required a physical effort to draw it down into his lungs. From the doorway he looked into the showroom. In the centre of the wide floor stood the latest demonstration model Cadillac, and beside it stood a couple. The man had his back to Mark, and left only the impression of massive size, a towering figure dressed in dark cloth. Beside him the girl was dainty, almost ethereal. She seemed to float, light and lovely as a hummingbird on invisible wings. The earth tilted beneath Mark's feet as he gazed at her. Her head was thrown back to look up at the man. Her throat was long and smooth, balancing the small head with its huge dark eyes and the laughing mouth, small white regular teeth beyond pink lips, a fine bold brow pale and wide above those haunting eyes, and all of it crowned by a heart-stopping tumble of thick lustrous hair, hair so black that its waves and falls seemed to be sculptured from freshly oiled ebony. She laughed again, a lovely joyous ripple of sound and she reached up to touch the man's face. Her hand was narrow, with long tapered fingers, strong, capable-looking hands, so that Mark realised that his first impression had been wrong. The girl was small only in comparison to the man, and her poise heightened the illusion. However, Mark saw now that she was tall, but graceful as a papyrus stem in the wind, supple and slim, with tiny waist and long legs beneath the light-floating material of her skirt. With her fingertips she traced the jawline of the man, tilting her head on its long swan-like neck. Her beauty was almost unbearable, as her huge eyes shone now with love, and the line of the lips was soft with love. Oh, Daddy, you're an old-fashioned grumpy old bear, she spun away from him, lightly as a ballerina, 
and struck an exaggerated pose beside the huge glistening machine, putting on a comic French accent. Regardez, mon cher papa, c'est très chic, the man growled. Well, I don't trust these fancy new machines. Give me a Rolls. Rolls, cried the girl, pouting dramatically. They're so staid, so biblical, darling daddy. This is the twentieth century, remember? Then she drooped like a dying rose in a vase. How could I hold up my head among my friends if you force me to ride in one of those great sombre coffins? At that instant she noticed Mark standing in the doorway of the sales office, and her entire mien changed. The carriage of head and body, the expression of mouth and eye flowing instantly from clown to lady. A pater, she said softly, the voice cultivated and the eye cool as it flickered over Mark, a steady encompassing sweep from his head to his feet. I think the salesperson is here. She turned away, and Mark felt his heart convulse again at the way her hips swung and pushed beneath the skirt, and he saw for the first time the cheeky, challenging roll of her small, rounded backside as she walked slowly around the Cadillac, calm and aloof, not glancing in his direction again. Mark stared at her with fascination, all his emotions in upheaval. He had never seen anything so beautiful, so completely captivating in all of his life. The man had turned and was glaring at him angrily. He seemed, as the girl had teased him, to be biblical. A gaunt and towering figure, with shoulders wide as the gallows tree and the big fierce head exaggerated in size by the slightly twisted hooked nose and the dark thick bush of beard shot through with grey. I know you, damn it, he growled. The face had been burned almost black by twenty thousand suns but there were deep white creases in the corners of the eyes, and the skin in a line below the thick curls of his silvering hair was white also, protected by the band of a hunter's cap, or a uniform cap. Mark roused himself, tearing his eyes off the girl, for the fresh shock of recognition. At the time he could only believe it was some monstrous coincidence, but in the years that followed he would know differently. The threads of their lives were plaited and intertwined, but in this instant the shock coming so close on the other, unsettled him, and his voice croaked. Uh, yes, uh, General Courtney, I'm... Um, uh, don't tell me, goddammit, the general cut in, his voice like the crack of a mauser shooting from cover, and Mark felt his spirit quail before the expression on his face. It was the most formidable he had ever confronted. I know, the name is right there, he glowered at Mark. I never forget a face. The tremendous force and presence of the man threatened to swamp him, it's a sign of old age, Pater, said the girl coolly, glancing over her shoulder without smile or expression. Don't you say that, girl, the man rumbled like an active volcano. Don't you dare say that. He took a threatening step towards Mark, the dark brow corrugated and the blue eyes cutting into his soul like surgeon's knives. It's the eyes, those eyes. Mark retreated a hurried step before the limping, mountainous advance, not quite sure what to expect but ready to believe that Sean Courtney might at any moment lunge at him with the heavy ebony cane he carried, so murderous seemed his anger. General, yes, Sean Courtney snapped his fingers with a crack like a breaking oak branch, and the scowl smoothed away, the blue eyes crinkling into a smile of such charisma, of such infectious and conspiratorial glee, that Mark had to smile back at him. Anders, he said. Anders and MacDonald. Uh, Martin, Martin, Michael, Michael... No, 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 no! Mark Anders. And he clenched his fist and struck his own thigh. Old, is it, girl? Who said old? Pater, you are a marvel, she rolled her eyes. But Sean Courtney was advancing on Mark, seizing his hand in a grip that made the bones creak, until he recovered himself and squeezed back, matching the big man's grip. It was the eyes, <laughs> laughed Sean. You've changed so much from that day, or that night. And the laughter died as he remembered the boy on the stretcher, pale and moribund, smeared with mud and thick drying blood, and heard again his own voice. He's dead! He drove back the image. How are you now, my boy? Uh, I'm fine, sir. I didn't think you were going to pull through. Sean peered closely at him. Ah, oh, Grant, you seem to have made it with all your colours flying. How many did you collect and where? Two, sir. High in the back. Honourable scars, my boy. We'll compare notes one day. And then he scowled again horrendously. You got the gong, didn't you? Uh, yes, sir. Good, you never know in this man's army. I wrote the citation that night, but you never know. What did they give you? 
Sean smiled his relief. The M.M., sir. I got it at the hospital in England. Excellent, that's good, he nodded, and he let go of Mark's hand, turning to the girl again. Darling, this gentleman was with me in France. How nice. She touched the design on the radiator of the car with one finger as she drifted past it, not glancing back at them. Do you think we might have a drive now, Peter? Mark hurried to the back door to hold it open. I'll drive, she said, and waited for him to jump to the driver's door. The starter button is here, he explained. Thank you, I know. Sit in the back, please. She drove like a man, very fast but skilfully, picking a tight line into the corners and using the gearbox to brake, double declutching with dancing feet on the pedals and hitting the shift with a quick, sure hand. Beside her, the general sat with the set to his shoulders of a younger man. You drive too fast, he growled, the ferocious tone given the complete lie by the fond smile he turned on her. And you're an old fusspot, Daddy, she laughed again. The thrill of it sang in Mark's ears as she hurled the big, powerful machine into the next bend. I didn't beat you enough when you were young. Well, it's too late now. She touched his cheek with her free hand. Oh, don't bank on that, young lady. Don't ever take bets on that. Shaking his head in mock despair, but with the adoration still glowing in his eyes, the general heaved himself around in the seat and subjected Mark to another dark, penetrating scrutiny. You don't turn out at the weekly parades? No, sir. It's an hour on Friday evenings, half an hour square bashing and then a lecture. Yes, sir. Good fun, really. Tremendous spirit, even though we have combined with the other peacetime regiments now. Yes, sir. I'm the colonel-in-chief, Sean chuckled. They couldn't get rid of me that easily. No, sir. We have a monthly shoot, good prizes and a barbecue afterwards. Is that so, sir? We're sending a team to shoot for the Africa Cup this year. All expenses paid. Marvellous opportunity for the lucky lads who get chosen. I'm sure, General. Sean waited for more, but Mark was silent. He could not meet the big man's fierce, unrelenting gaze, and he shifted his eyes, catching as he did so the girl's face reflected in the rearview mirror. She was watching him intently, with an unfathomable expression. Contempt, perhaps? Dry amusement, maybe? Or something else? Something much more intriguing or dangerous. For the split part of an instant their eyes met, and then her head turned away on the tall, graceful column of her neck. The dark, shining hair was brushed away from the nape, and there at the juncture with pale skin the hair was fine and silky, a tiny whirl of it, like a question mark, at the back of her small, sculptured ear. Mark had an almost insane desire to lean forward and press his lips to it, the thought struck like a physical blow in his groin, and he felt the nerves along his spine racked out cruelly. He realised suddenly then, with a shock that made his senses tilt again, that he was in love with her. I want to win that cup, said the general, watching him. The regiment's never won it before. I've uh, rather had enough of uniform and war, general, Mark forced his eyes back to meet the generals, but I do wish you good luck. The chauffeur held the rear door of the roll's silver wraith open, and Sean Courtney lowered himself into the seat beside his daughter. He lifted his right hand in a brief, almost military salute at the young man on the pavement, and the car pulled smoothly away. The instant they were alone, his daughter let out a girlish squeal of delight and threw both arms around his neck, ruffling his beard and his heart with her kisses. Oh, Daddy, darling, you spoil me. Yes, I do, don't I? Irene will turn bright green and curl up like an anchovy. I love you, my kind and beautiful daddy. Mm. Her father has never bought her a Cadillac. I like that lad. He's one of the bright ones. The salesperson? I hadn't really noticed. She released her grip and sat back in the seat. He's got heart. He was silent a moment then, remembering the snow falling silently across a shell-ravaged hill in France. He's got the guts and brightness for better things than selling motor cars. Then he grinned mischievously, looking young enough to be her brother. And I'd love to see Hamilton's face when we take the Africa Cup away from him. Beside him, Storm Courtney was silent, her hand still in the crook of her father's arm, while she wondered what had disturbed her about Mark Anders. She decided it was his eyes, those serene yellow eyes, calm but watchful, floating like golden moons.
Involuntarily, Mark braked the big car almost to a standstill before the white gates. They were tall twin columns, plastered and whitewashed, with the Zulu name in raised letters on each. Emoyeni. It was a lovely, haunting name. The place of the wind. And on the crest of the hills above Durban town, it would indeed receive the cool blessing of the sea breezes during the sweltering summer months. The swinging portion of the gate was two racks of heavy cast-iron spears. But they stood open now, and Mark crossed the iron grid, which would prevent hooved animals entering or escaping, and started up the gentle curve of the driveway, butter-yellow flint pebbles carefully raked and freshly watered, set on each side with deep beds of cannas, which were now in full bloom. They had been ar arranged in banks of solid colour, scarlet and yellow and white, dazzling in the bright sunshine, and beyond them were lush lawns of deep tropical green, mown carpet smooth but studded with clumps of indigenous trees, which had obviously been spared for their size or beauty or unusual shape. They were festooned with garlands of lianas, the ubiquitous monkey rope plants of Natal. And even as Mark watched, a small blue-grey vervet monkey dropped lithely down one of the living ropes, and with its back arched like a cat and its long tail held high in mock alarm, bounded across an open stretch of lawn until it reached the next clump of trees, where it shot to the highest branches and chattered insolently at the slowly passing car. Mark knew from his investigation that this was merely the Courtney townhouse. The main family home was at Ladyburg, and he had not expected anything like the splendour. And yet why not? he grinned wryly. The man had everything in the world. This was a mere pied de terre He twisted his head to look back. The gates were out of sight behind him now, and there was still no sign of the house ahead. He was surrounded by a fantasy landscape, half wild and yet lovingly groomed and tended. And now he saw the reason for the animal grid at the main gates. Small herds of semi-domesticated game cropped at the short grass of the lawn or stood and watched the passing car with mild curiosity. He saw graceful golden-brown impala with snowy bellies and spindly back-curved horns, a dainty blue diker as big as a fox terrier with pricked-up ears and bright button eyes, an Eden bull with hanging dewlap, thick twisted horns arming the short heavy head and a barrel body heavy as a pedigree Africanda bull. He crossed a low bridge over the narrow neck of an artificial lake. The blue water lotus blooms stood high above their huge round green leaves that floated flat on the surface. Their perfume was light and sweet and nostalgic on the bright warm air, and the dark torpedo shapes of bass hung suspended in the clear water below the sheltering lotus leaves. On the edge of the lake, a black-and-white spur-winged goose spread its wings as wide as the reach of a man's arms and pressed forward with snake-like neck and pink wattled head, threatening flight at the intrusion. Then, thinking better of such effort, it furled the great wings again and waggled its tail, satisfied with a single harsh honk of protest as the Cadillac passed. The roof of the house showed through the trees ahead now, and it was tiled in candy pink, towered and turreted and ridged like a Spanish palace. The last curve of the driveway brought Mark out into full view of the building. Before it lay an open expanse of blazing flower beds. The colour was so vibrant and so concentrated that it daunted the eye, and was relieved only by the tall, soft ostrich feathers of spray that poured high into the air from the fountains set in the centre of the four round ponds, parapeted in stone. The breeze blew soft wisps of spray like smoke across the flower beds, wetting the blooms and enhancing the already dazzling colour. The house was two storeys high, with random towers breaking the solid silhouette and columns twisted like candy sticks. Ornamenting the entrance and supporting the window lintels, it was painted white, and it shone in the sunlight like a block of ice. It should have given the impression of solid size and ostentatious display, but the design was so cunning that it seemed light as a French pastry, a gay and happy house, built in a spirit of fun and probably of love, a rich man's gift to a lovely woman, for the feminine touch was everywhere evident, and the great masses of flowers, the fountains and peacocks and marble statues, seemed right, the only setting for such a structure. Slowly, awed and enchanted, Mark let the Cadillac roll down the last curve of the driveway, and the light, faint cries of female voices caught his attention. The tennis court stood at the end of the lawns, 
and there were women at play, their white dresses sparkling in the sun, their limbs flashing as they ran and swerved and struck at the ball. Their voices and laughter were sweet and melodious in the warm hush of the tropical mid-morning. Mark left the car and started to cross the lawn towards the courts. There were other female figures, also white-clad, that lolled in deck chairs in the shade of the banyan trees, watching the play and conversing languidly as they sipped at long frosted glasses, waiting their turn on the courts. None of them noticed Mark until he was on the edge of their group. Oh, I say, girls, one of them turned quickly in her chair, and appraised Mark with eyes suddenly no longer bored, but clear blue and acquisitive. A man, we are in luck. Instantly the other three changed, each reacting differently one exaggerating her indifferent and indolent loll in the low chair, another tugging at her skirt with one hand and pushing at her hair with the other, smiling brightly and sucking in her tummy. They were all young and sleek as cats, glossy with youth and health, and that elusive but unmistakable aura of wealth and breeding. "'And what is your pleasure, sir?' asked the one with blue eyes. She was the prettiest of the four with fine, pale, golden hair in a halo around the small, neat head and good white teeth as she smiled. Mark felt discomforted under their stares, especially when the speaker turned further in her chair, slowly uncrossed and crossed her legs, managing to give Mark a flash of white silk panties under the short skirt. "'I'm looking for um, Miss Storm Courtney.' "'God!' said the smiler. "'They all want Storm!' Why don't any of them ever want me? Storm, the blonde called out to the court. Storm Courtney was about to serve, but the call distracted her and she glanced across. She saw Mark and her expression did not change. Her attention switched back to the game. She threw the ball high and swung overhand at it. The stroke was fluid and controlled. The racket twanged sharply and the movement threw her white cotton skirt high against the back of her thighs. Her legs were beautifully moulded, slim ankles and gently swelling calves, knees marked only by symmetrical dimples. She spun lightly and caught the return of the ball, a long, lightly tanned arm flashing in a full sweep, and the ball leapt from the racket in a white blur. Again her skirt kicked up, and Mark shifted slightly on his feet, for the earth had tilted again. She ran back to the baseline, short, neat steps on those long, narrow feet, head thrown back to follow the high parabola of the lobbing ball against the blue of the sky. Her dark hair seemed to glow with the metallic sheen of a sunbird's wing as she judged her stroke, and then her whole body went into it, power uncoiling along those long, beautiful legs, driven up from tensed and rounded buttocks under the light cotton skirt, through the narrow waist, along young, hard black muscles, and exploding down through the swinging right arm. The ball hummed like an arrow, flashed low across the net, and kicked a white puff of dust from the baseline. Too good, wailed her opponent despairingly, and Storm laughed, gay and triumphant, and came back to the high fence to pick up the spare balls from the gutter. Oh, Storm, there's a gentleman here to see you, the blonde called again, and Storm flipped up a ball with the tip of her racket and the side of her foot, bouncing it once on the turf of the court and then catching it in her free hand, Yes, Irene, she answered lightly. I know, he's only a salesperson. Ask him to wait by the car until I'm ready to deal with him. She had not looked at Mark again, and now she turned away. Forty, love, she called gaily, and ran back to the baseline. Her voice had a music and a lilt that did nothing to sweeten the sudden flare of anger which made Mark's jaw set grimly. If you are a salesperson, Irene murmured, then you can sell me something sometime. But right now, darling, I suggest you do what Storm says, otherwise we'll all know about it. When Storm came to where he waited, she was flanked by the other girls, like maids in waiting attending a princess, he thought, and he felt his resentment fade as he watched her. You could forgive somebody like that, somebody so royal and lovely and heart-achingly beautiful. You could forgive them anything. He stood attentive, waiting for her, and he realised then how tall she was, the top of that glossy head reached to his chin, almost. Good morning, Miss Courtney. I've brought you a new Cadillac, and all of us at Natal Motors wish you much joy and enjoyment. It was a little speech he always used when making a delivery, and he spoke it with all the warmth and charm and sincerity which had made him in so few months the star salesman of Natal Motors. 
Where are the keys? Storm Courtney asked, and for the first time looked at him directly. Mark realised that her eyes were that dark, almost black blue, like the General's. There was no question who her father was. She opened them a little wider, and in the sunlight they were the colour of polished sapphires or the blue of the Mozambique current out in the deep water at noon. They're in the car, he answered, and his voice sounded strange in his own ears, as though it came from a distance. Get them, she said, and he felt himself start to move, to hurry to her bidding. Then something like that sense of danger he had known and developed in France warned him. Her expression was neutral, completely unconcerned, as though she found the effort of talking directly to him was wasted, just one of these tiresome moments in an otherwise important march of events. Yet the warning was clear as the chime of a bell in his head, and only then he saw something else move in her eyes, something dangerous and exciting, like the shape of a leopard hunting in the shadows. A challenge, perhaps a dare. And suddenly he knew clearly that no daughter of Sean Courtney would be reared to such natural arrogance and rudeness. There was a reason, some design in her attitude. He felt a lightness of mind, that kind of special madness which had driven away fear of consequence so often in moments of peril or desperate enterprise, and he grinned at her. He did not have to force the grin. It was natural and devilish and challenging. Certainly, Miss Courtney, of course I'll get them. Just as soon as you say, please. There was an audible communal gasp from the girls around her. And they stilled with awed delight, their eyes darting to Storm's face and then back to Mark's. Say please to the nice man, Stormy. Irene used the patronising voice for instructing young children. And there was a delighted burst of giggles from the others. For one unholy instant, something burned in the girl's dark blue eyes, something fierce that was not anger. Mark recognised the importance of that flash. Although he did not truly know the exact emotion it betrayed, yet he knew it might affect him. Then it was gone, and in its place was true, unfeigned anger. How dare you! Storm's voice was low and quivering, but her lips were suddenly frosty white as the blood drained away. The anger was too swift, too strong for the occasion, out of all proportion to the mild exchange, and Mark felt a reckless excitement that he had been able to reach her so deeply. He kept the grin mocking and taunting. Hit him, darling, Irene teased, and for a moment Mark thought she really might. You keep your silly mouth shut, Irene Luchars. Ooh la la, Irene gloated. Tempa? Mark turned casually away and opened the driver's door of the Cadillac. Where are you going? Back to town. He started the engine and looked out of the window at her. There was no doubt now that she was the most beautiful creature he had ever seen. Anger had rouged her cheeks, and the fine dark hair at her temples was still damp from her play on the courts. It was plastered against the smooth skin in tiny curls. That is my car. Oh, they'll send somebody else up with it, Mrs Courtney, I'm sure because I'm only used to dealing with ladies. Again, the wondering gasp and burst of giggles. Oh, he's a darling! Irene clapped her hands in applause, but Storm ignored her. My father will have you fired. Yes, he probably will, he agreed. Mark thought about that solemnly for a moment, and then he nodded and let out the clutch. He looked back in the mirror as he took the first bend in the driveway, and they were still standing in a group staring after him in their white dresses like a group of marble statues. Nymphs startled by satyr was a fitting title, he thought, and laughed with the reckless mood still on him. 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 Jesus, Dicky Lankham whispered, clutching his brow with horror. What made you do it? He shook his head slowly, wonderingly. She was damned rude. Dickie dropped his hands and stared at him aghast. She was rude to you? Oh, my God, I don't think I can stand much more. Don't you realise that if she was rude to you, you should be grateful? Don't you know that there are thousands of peasants like us who go through their entire lives without being insulted by Miss Storm Courtney? I was not going to take that, Mark explained reasonably, but Dickie cut in. Look, old Bean, I've taught you all I know, and you still know nothing. 
Not only do you take it, but if Miss Courtney expresses a desire to kick your fat, stupid ass, the correct reply is, certainly, ma'am, but first let me don fresh bags lest I soil your pretty foot. Mark laughed, the reckless mood still there but fading, and Dickie's expression became more lugubrious. That's right, have yourself a good laugh. Do you know what happened? And before Mark could answer, he went on. A summons from on high, the ultimate, the chairman of the board himself. So the boss and I dash across town. Fear, trepidation, cautious optimism. Are we to be fired, promoted, congratulated on the month's sales figures? And there is the board, the full board, mind you, looking like a convention of undertakers who have just been informed of the discovery of Pasteur's vaccine. Dickie stopped. The memory was too painful, and he sighed heavily. You didn't really tell her to say please, did you? Mark nodded. You didn't really tell her she was not a lady. Well, not directly, Mark protested, but I did imply it. Dickie Lankham tried to wipe his face off with one hand, starting at the hairline and drawing the palm of his hand down slowly to his chin. I've got to fire you, you know that, don't you? Mark nodded again. Look, said Dickie, I tried, Mark, I really did. I showed them your sales figures, I told them you were young, impulsive, I made a speech. Thank you, Dickie. At the end of the speech, they almost fired me also. You shouldn't have stuck your neck out for me. Anyone else? <laughs> you could have picked on anyone else, old chap. You could have punched the mayor, sent abusive letters to the king. But why, in the name of all holy things, did you have to pick on a Courtney? You know something, Dicky? And it was Dicky's turn, silently, to shake his head. I loved it. I loved every moment of it. Dicky groaned aloud as he took out his silver cigarette case and offered it to Mark. They lit their cigarettes and smoked in silence for a few moments. Sir, I'm fired then, Mark asked at last. That's what I've been trying to tell you for the last ten minutes, Dicky agreed. Mark began to clear out the drawers in his desk, then stopped and asked impulsively, Did the General, uh, did General Courtney make the demand for my head? I've no idea, old chap, but sure as hell it was made. Mark wanted to believe that it had not been the general. It was too mean a gesture from such a big man. He could imagine the general bursting into the showroom, brandishing a horsewhip. The man who could take such revenge for a small flash of spirit might be capable of other things, like killing an old man for his land. The thought sickened Mark, and he tried to thrust it aside. Well, then I suppose I'd better be getting along. I'm sorry, old Bean. Dickie stood up and offered his hand, then looked embarrassed. You all right for the filthy lucre? I could let you have a tenner to tide you over. No, thanks, Dickie, but I'll be all right. Look, Dickie blurted out impulsively, give it a month or so, time for the dust to settle, and then if you haven't got yourself fixed, come and see me and I'll try and sneak you in again through the back door, even if we have to write you up on the pay sheet under an assumed name. Goodbye, Dick. Well, thanks for everything. I really mean that. I'm going to miss you, old chap. Keep your head down below the parapet in future, won't you? The pawn shop was in Soldier's Way, almost directly opposite the railway station. The front room was small and overcrowded with a vast array of valuables, semi-valuables and rubbish left here by the needy over the years. There was a melancholy about the racks of yellowing wedding dresses in the dusty glass cases of old wedding rings engraved watches, cigarette cases and silver drinking flasks, all given in love or respect, each with its own sad story. Two pounds, said the pawnbroker, after a single glance at the suit. It's only three months old, Mark said softly, and I paid fifteen. The man shrugged, and the steel-framed spectacles slid down his nose. Two pounds, he repeated, and pushed the spectacles up with a thumb that looked grey and dusty as his stock. All right, and what about this? He opened the small blue case and showed the bronze disc nestled in a nest of silk pinned by its gay little ribbon of white and red and blue. The military medal for gallantry displayed by non-commissioned officers and other ranks. Eh, we get a lot of those, not much call for them, the man pursed thin lips. Twelve pounds ten, he said. How long do you keep them before you sell them? Mark asked, suddenly reluctant to part with the scrap of metal and silk. 
Oh, we keep him a year. The last ten days of constant search for employment had depleted Mark's resources of cash and courage. You're right, he agreed. The pawnbroker wrote the ticket, while Mark wandered into the back reaches of the shop. He found a bundle of old military haversacks and selected one. Then there was a rack of rifles, most of them ancient martinis and mausers, veterans of the Boer War. But there was one among them that stood out. The woodwork was hardly marked, and the metal shone smooth and oily, no scratches or pitting of rust, and Mark picked the weapon off the rack, and the shape and feel of it brought memories crowding back. He thrust them aside. He would need a rifle where he was going, and it was sensible to have one he knew so well. Fate had put a P-14 there for him, and damn the memories, he decided. He slipped the bolt from the breech and held the barrel to the light from the doorway, peering into the mouth of the breech. The bore of the barrel was unmarked. The rifling described its clean, glistening spirals, again without fouling or pitting. Somebody had cared well for the weapon. How much? he asked the pawnbroker, and the man's eyes turned to lifeless pebbles behind his steel-rimmed spectacles. That's a very good rifle, he said, and I paid a lot of money for it. There's a hundred rounds of ammunition goes with it also. Mark found he had gone soft in the city. His feet ached within the first five miles, and the straps of rifle and haversack cut painfully into his shoulders. The first night he lay down beside the fire and slept as though he had been clubbed. In the morning he groaned at the effort of sitting upright. The stiffness was in his legs and back and shoulders. The first mile he hobbled like an old man until his muscles began to ease, and he was going well by the time he reached the rim of the escarpment and started down into the coastal lowlands. He kept well away from Anders' land, crossing the river five miles upstream. His clothing and rifle and pack were balanced on his head as he waded through a shallow place between white sandbanks, and he dried naked in the sun, sprawled out like a lizard on a rock, before he dressed again and headed north. The third day he settled into the long, swinging hunter's stride, and the pack rode lightly on his back. The going was hard. The undulating folds of the ground forced him to climb and then descend, taxing every muscle, while the thick thorn scrub made him weave constantly to find a way through, wasting time and almost doubling the distance between point and point. Added to this, the grass was dried and seeding. The seeds were sharp as spears and worked easily through his woollen socks into his flesh. He had to stop every half hour or so to dig them out. But still he made thirty miles that day. In the gathering dusk, he crossed another of the countless ridges of higher ground. The distant blue loom of Charka's gate almost blended with darkening clouds of evening. He camped there that night, sweeping a bed on the bare ground below an acacia thorn tree and eating bully beef and maize porridge by the light of the fire of acacia wood that burned with its characteristic bright white flame and smell of incense. General Sean Courtney stood at the heavy teak sideboard with its tiers of engraved glass mirrors and displays of silver plate. In one hand he held the ivory-handled carving fork and in the other the long Sheffield knife. He used the knife to illustrate the point he was making to the guest of honour at his table. I read it through in a single day. Had to stay up until after midnight. Believe me, Jan, it's the best work yet. The amount of research is quite extraordinary. I look forward to reading it, said the Prime Minister, nodding acknowledgement to the author of the work under discussion. It's still in manuscript. I'm not entirely satisfied yet. There is still some tidying up to do. Sean turned back to the roast, and with a single practised stroke of the blade for each, cut five thin slices of pink beef rimmed with a rind of rich yellow fat. With the fork he lifted the meat onto the Rosenthal porcelain plate, and immediately a Zulu servant in a flowing white kanza robe and red pillbox fez carried the plate to Sean's place at the head of the long table. Sean laid the carving knife aside, wiped his hands on a linen cloth, and then followed the servant to the table and took his seat. We were wondering if you might write a short forward for the book, Sean said, as he raised a cut crystal glass of glowing red wine to the Prime Minister and young Christian Smuts inclined his head on narrow shoulders in an almost bird-like gesture. He was a small man, 
and the hands laid before him on the table were almost fragile. He had the mien of a philosopher, or a scholar, which was not dispelled by the neat pointed beard. Yet it was hard to believe that he was small. There was a vital force and awesome presence about him that belied the high, rather thin voice in which he replied, Few things would give me as much pleasure. You do me honour. He seemed to bulk huge in his chair. Such was the power of the character he commanded. I am the one who is honoured, Colonel Garrick Courtney replied gravely from across the table, bowing slightly, and Sean watched his brother fondly. Poor Gary, he thought, and then felt a guilty stab. Yet it seemed so natural to think of him in those terms. He was frail and old now, bowed and grey and dried out, so that he seemed smaller even than the little man opposite him. "'Have you a title yet?' asked Jan Smuts. "'I have thought to call it the Young Eagles. "'I hope you do not find that too melodramatic "'for a history of the Royal Flying Corps.' "'By no means,' Smuts contradicted him. "'I think it's excellent.' "'Poor Gary,' Sean thought again. "'Since Michael had been shot down, "'the book filled the terrible gap "'that his son's death had left him. "'But it had not prevented him from growing old. "'The book was a memorial to Michael, of course.' an act of great love. This book is dedicated to Captain Michael Courtney, DFC, one of the young eagles who will fly no more. Sean felt the resuscitation of his own grief, and he made a visible effort to suppress it. His wife saw the effort, and caught his eye down the length of the table. How well she knew him after all these years, how perfectly she could read his emotions, she thought, as she smiled her sympathy for him, and saw him respond the wide shoulders squaring up and heavy bearded jaws firming as he smiled back at her. Deftly she changed the mood. General Smuts has promised to walk around the gardens with me this afternoon, Gary, and advise me on planting out the proteas he brought me from Table Mountain. You are also such a knowledgeable botanist. Will you join us? As I warned you, my dear Ruth, said young Smuts in that ready yet compelling voice, I do not give much hope for their survival. Perhaps the leucodendrons, ventured Gary, if we find a cool, dryish place? Yes, agreed the general, and immediately they fell into an animated discussion. She had done it so skilfully that she seemed to have done nothing. Sean paused in the doorway of his study and ran a long, lingering gaze over the room. As always, he felt a glow of pleasure at re-entering the sanctuary. The glass doors opened now onto the massed banks of flowers and the smoking plumes of the fountain, yet the thick walls ensured that the room remained cool even in the sleepy hush of midday. He crossed to the desk of Stinkwood, dark and massive and polished, so that it shone even in the cool gloom, and he lowered himself into the swivel chair, feeling the fine leather stretch and give under his weight. The day's mail was neatly arranged on a silver salver at his right hand, and he sighed when he saw that, despite the careful screening by the senior clerk down at the city head office, there was still not much less than a hundred envelopes waiting him. He delayed the moment by swinging the chair slowly to look once again about the room. It was hard to believe it had been designed and decorated by a woman, unless it was a woman who loved and understood her man so well that she could anticipate his lightest whim and fancy. Most of the books were bound in dark green leather, and stamped on their spine in gold leaf with Sean's crest. The exceptions were the three ceiling-high shelves of first editions with African themes. A dealer in London and another in Amsterdam had carte blanche instructions from Sean to search for these treasures. There were autographed first editions by Stanley, Livingston, Cornwallis, Harris, Birchall, Munro, and almost every other African explorer or hunter who had ever published the dark panelled woodwork between the bookshelves was studded with the paintings of the early African artists. The banes glowed like rich gems in their flamboyant colours and naive, almost childlike depiction of animal and countryside. One of these was set in an intricately carved frame of Rhodesian redwood and engraved, To my friend David Livingstone, from Thomas Baines. These links with history and the past always warmed Sean with pleasure and he fell into a mild reverie. The deep carpeting deadened her footsteps, but there was the light perfume on the air that warned Sean of her presence, 
and he swung his chair back to the desk. She stood beside his chair, slim and straight as a girl, still. 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 Still.